Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's October 6, 2011 meeting. And if you would please all stand with me and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. A notice to all that today's proceedings, as usual, are being um, live streamed uh, on the web. Um, and noting the presence of a quorum, uh, we'll call the meeting to order and proceed along the agenda as has been uh, advertised. Agenda, number, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. And I'll simply uh, say that we had a um, on September 13th, we had a very successful uh, full day, one day, full day um, interagency security task force meeting where we have been looking at the incorporation of good design principles with uh, appropriate security um, measures for the federal triangle uh, area. Um, on September 13th, we uh, built Dowd and Mina Wright and Austin Smith of the interagency security committee all uh, had presentations. Um, so those were representing uh, three good partnership uh, agencies. The morning session, uh, Brian Michael Jen Jenkins, who's a senior advisor and security expert at RAND, um, was a keynote speaker. And he talked about the, ev the evolving nature of the threat that we, are, um, we have to be very mindful of in the nation's capital. Uh, we also had DHS briefings. Um, or presentation. The MITRE Corporation was here and had their experts uh, discussing a systems approach to geographic areas. The afternoon session focused uh, not on the security side but on the urban design side. Um, Frank Giblin of GSA, um, Alan Ward of Sasaki, Rob Rogers of Rogers Marvel, and Tom Veneer of AIA uh, were all here and talked about uh, uh, techniques and very good examples of where we have had successful security and planning efforts in an urban landscape um, and other places. Um, and then we had a open roundtable discussion uh, at the end of the day. So it was a very good day, very productive. We had all the right people, the key people, um, uh, key agencies involved. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to Bill Dowd and his team for organizing a, a very good uh, event. That ends uh, the chairman's report. Any questions on that? Hearing none. Uh, agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. I just have a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, uh, in response to the uh, recent commission retreat uh, that we held early, earlier this year, as well as the Plain Writing Act, uh, staff is proposing a new format for agency's recommendations and actions. I've attached samples uh, that are included in your packet. Uh, of, of, these new, of this new proposal. The new format is designed to make the documents easier to read and understand by highlighting key information and better outlining our review process. In addition to the formatting changes, staff is focusing on writing recommendations in a more clear and concise manner and incorporating graphics more effectively. Uh, so we welcome your feedback on the new format. And if you have any comments, please send those to Deborah Young. Uh, we'll also solicit feedback on the new format from the public uh, over the next 30 days to our website. Uh, after the uh, feedback period and any uh, revisions that we might make, we anticipate using this format effective January 2012. Um, in addition, on Tuesday, October 18th at 6.30 p.m., NCPC and the Embassy of Canada welcome Canadian architect Bing Tom, designer of DC's new arena stage. Mr. Tom will explore the legacy of mid-century modernism in Washington and how we could preserve the recent past while embracing the future. Uh, this speaker series event will be held at the Embassy of Canada right here on Pennsylvania Avenue. And we hope the commission and members of the public are able to attend. And finally, some very good news. Uh, the Monumental Core Framework Plan was selected for an American Society of Landscape Architects uh, 2011 Professional Honor Award only one of uh, 37 awarded nationally. Um, this is a very uh, important award for the commission. I'd like to thank the uh, commission for their support 
uh, of this plan and also to the project staff, uh, Bill Dowd, Elizabeth Miller, Shane Detman, Stephanie Brown, Paul Jutton, also our partners at the Commission of Fine Arts, and also our consulting team. I see Joe Brown uh, in the audience uh, of AECOM uh, and their staff, uh, Alan Harwood and uh, Ryan Boma. So congratulations to you all. Uh, Terrific, thank you. That concludes my report. And here's the, the announcement on the arena stage um, discussion that we're doing in conjunction with the Embassy of Canada. Um, it'll also be, if it's not already, on NCP website. So we hope we have a good turnout uh, for that. Item three on the agenda is the legislative update. update. Uh, Ms. Schuyler? I have nothing to report, sir. Thank you very much. And then item agenda, agenda item number four is the consent calendar. And we have five items. Uh, four, item 4A is the electric generating equipment at Fort McNair, 4B, is the electric generating equipment at Joint Base uh, Meyer Henderson Hall. 4C is the water tank and building 10 wireless communications antennas at the uh, Naval Surface Warfare Center. 4D is site improvements and perimeter security at the Federal Reserve Building. And last, 4E is the temporary emergency boiler stack system at Central Heating uh, Refrigeration Plant. Um, any questions on the consent calendar? Hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of adopting the consent calendar say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's adopted. Um, next on the agenda is a terrific presentation um, on the Eisenhower Memorial. Uh, this is an information session. No votes being taken today. It's our opportunity to hear from the design team and others on uh, their progress, uh, what has changed since the last time uh, they were before us, uh, what some of the outstanding uh, remaining issues uh, there might be, um, and to have a general conversation. Again, no votes are being taken today. It's an information session uh, only. Uh, the Section 106 process is still going on, and uh, that's been very productive. Issues are being resolved in that very good forum and so uh, it's moving on and we have uh, to kick it off uh, Shane Detman from staff. Thank you Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission and good afternoon. Uh, staff's going to be uh, giving you a very 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 brief uh, uh, introduction on the steps that have been taken thus far in uh, establishing this memorial to uh, uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower and then we'll be handing it off to the design team uh, for its um, update on its uh, on the refinements that it's made with its preferred alternative uh, and the, uh, the, the, very, the positive progress that it has made uh, on that particular alternative since the Commission last saw this project back in February. <clears throat> and so again, very, very quickly, Congress authorized the development of the establishment of this memorial back in 1999 um, uh, through passage of a public law. It also, in addition to authorizing the creation of the memorial, created the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial Commission, uh, which you see there is, uh, is a 12-member commission. You see that they make up there. Uh, subsequent to the original authorization, Congress passed two, uh, two secondary uh, pieces of legislation, one which essentially uh, authorized the uh, location of the memorial within Washington, D.C. or its environs. And then lastly, back in May 2006, uh, Congress passed a law to authorize the memorial within Area 1, which is uh, identified in the uh, 2003 amendments of the Commemorative Works Act. Happening concurrently with the Congressional Acts, the, the Eisenhower Memorial Commission conducted a thorough uh, site selection process that looked at 26 sites and ultimately selected uh, what's, what was referred to as the Maryland Avenue site, which is uh, highlighted in this orange circle there uh, on the map. Uh, this is just a closer look at the site. It's bound by Independence Avenue, uh, 4th and 6th Street, and the, and the Department of Education headquarters building on the south. Uh, the Maryland Avenue um, uh, right-of-way runs through the middle of the site. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the buildings, uh, the site and in relation to uh, the buildings that surround it. Uh, in September 2006, the commission approved this site with a uh, collection of design principles that were also subsumed into the uh, commission's um, NEPA FONSI for this project. <clears throat> uh, the commission last saw this project in February 2011. This is the site plan uh, that the commission uh, took an action on in addition to two other alternatives that the commission uh, reviewed and provided, provided comments on. Uh, actually, no formal action has been taken on this project, and this is just a picture of the model. <clears throat> um, and then finally, the last slide, this is, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is the, uh, the, com the comments that the Commission offered 
on this particular alternative um, of the project and uh, these were provided to you um, in advance of today's meeting and hopefully you had a chance to uh, take a look at them. Uh, their, the comments that were provided were relative to the design principles that were adopted um, at the site selection stage. And so uh, with that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of background on the project and I'd like to uh, hand it over to the design team uh, for them to give you an update on the, uh, the developments that have um, been made to the preferred alternative <clears throat> since February. Good afternoon, welcome. And uh, please identify yourself. There's a I'm Carl Riddell, Executive Director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, as a representative of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, I'm accompanied today by the Chairman of our Commission, Rocco Siciliano from uh, Beverly Hills, California, also Commissioner Alfred Godoldig from New York City, and also Senior Advisor to the Commission, Professor Louis Galambos of Johns Hopkins University, who advises us out of the context of his role as the editor of the 21 volumes papers of Dwight David Eisenhower, which were completed in the year 2001. Speaking to you today, uh, taking advantage of some of the information you've already received, the importance of us being an expression of the will of the American people in that the Congress of the United States established us roughly 50 years, a half century, after President Eisenhower completed his lifelong service to the country of the United States. Without elaborating on uh, the makeup of the commission itself, for us as a small staff, it's been a great advantage to have the continuity of the commission's uh, leadership. Uh, we've especially uh, been pleased with the kind of knowledge and in-depth experience and support we get from our vice chairman, Senator Daniel Inouye from Hawaii, who you know has been part of multiple memorializa memorialization projects here in the capital of the United States and elsewhere in the United States. We are entering the second decade of our existence. We held our first meeting in the year 2001. So we're conscious of the passage of time in a particular way in the context of other presidential memorials as well. But particularly from the year 2005, we've moved with what I would call rapid but deliberate speed. And that speed has been due to the fact that we've had this continuity of leadership from our uh, congressional uh, uh, leaders. It has also been due to the fact that there seems to be a timeliness with this president's memorialization as the realization of the substance of his contributions have continued to grow. But the reason perhaps more pertinent to our meeting today is that the design team has proven itself to be flexible, proven itself to be responsive, and has had in mind the multiple concerns that are part of such a complex project such as this. So the fact that Gary Partners, AECOM, Gilbane Construction, GSA, and others have worked so well together and that we've enjoyed the leadership of the National Park Service as our lead agency has meant that we've moved faster perhaps than others would have anticipated. The design of the memorial has benefited from the review process in a very particular way. You might imagine I would especially be mindful of the first meeting with the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission. And as a result of that review process, we were driven to verify and authenticate and validate why such a preeminent location should be there in perpetuity for this citizen of the United States, Dwight David Eisenhower. And in that process, we've learned a great deal about the president and the thematic context of this site is dramatically appropriate. Eisenhower had a lifelong personal commitment to freedom and he knew that freedom didn't mean anything unless you were healthy, educated, and had a sense of well-being, and he created the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and I could go on speaking about that uh, thematic context. So having to meet and consult with the National Capital Memorial Advisory Commission was appropriate, helpful, and useful. We 
we're in much the same posture, of course, as you well know, with the Commission of Fine Arts. And we were directly affected, I believe, by their guidance on the artistic quality and the aesthetic direction of the design and where it should go. And in fact, just this past month, we had a meeting uh, which was summarized in a good letter of the 22nd of September, copies of which we have available, if anyone would care to see and look at that. But at that meeting, they gave strong support to the revised configuration that has been developed by the design team. They commended the overall height and scale of the columns and of the, the tapestries, and they expressed support for the landscape uh, image, which is such an integral part of the tapestry. So we are really here today to speak to you to experience the same advantage that we have with the other review dimensions of what we're about, to benefit from that, and to move forward with this memorial to such a great American in a very simple way. He is one of the best pieces of evidence that we have that the American experiment works. He came from no advantage of family, no advantage of money, a pretty straightforward education, and he came to enjoy the respect and the affection of not only his fellow citizens, but of much of the world. It's a great story to share at this particular time in our history. We, as a result of the design team's professionalism and effectiveness, are on budget and on schedule. We would like to continue this collaborative spirit which has gotten us to this stage with your assistance and with your help. But I feel a particular sense of urgency and excitement about where we're at. And that's driven in part by my own age, I guess, perishability as time goes on, because our leadership is still rooted in the war that Eisenhower led so many thousands of Americans to their deaths in the process of destroying the German war machine. These people pass by the hundreds daily. Two of my senior leaders are combat veterans of World War II. Senator Daniel Inouye, as you know, daily carries to his meetings the missing arm as a souvenir of that. Uh, in a unit alongside Senator Inouye's unit was our chairman's unit, the 10th Mountain Division in the Italian theater. These gentlemen look at me and say, press on. Let's get it done. And of course, being a bit younger, I'm aware of the Korean War veterans. Eisenhower ended effectively two wars, the Korean War being the last. So we appreciate your support, your cooperation, and we are really privileged and pleased to be with you here today. Frank. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, I'm honored to be back again. Um, oh, we're taking it off. Uh, we did spend a lot of time with uh, the various commissions, the various uh, stakeholders, and we listened carefully to their, their uh, comments and have responded. Um, as best we can, retaining the integrity of the original design. The idea of the original design was to create a precinct that unified the three major buildings that surround it and, and um, okay, what's that? Okay. And, um, and, uh, and that became the idea of a tapestry. And we've done a lot of research since then. Uh, something like that has never been done before, as far as I know. And uh, we've gone far and wide to Japan and China and Rhode Island, Germany, wherever people weave these things and have uh, come up with several possible uh, solutions to them. And uh, one of them uh, we have evidence of here, or a couple of them. Uh, what became crucial to this was to create a, 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 an image that had transparency so that the, the, it didn't affect the views from the education building, especially, 
out to the uh, to the outdoors. Uh, we also wanted to uh, create a special kind of entrance to the Department of Education and created a, a walkway between the tapestry and the building, which is very uh, kind of a very special kind of space. Um, in the original scheme, which I don't have a slide of, but uh, we these uh, tapestries were parallel to Independence Avenue, if you recall. <laughs> and uh, the, the main tapestry came right out to the streets on each side. Yeah. Oh, here's the plan. So there are the original plan and the original tapestries uh, uh, with the columns. The columns were designed Structurally, that's what set the, the, the size of them. Uh, they were originally, uh, in, our, in our original design, the engineer said they had to be 12 feet in diameter. And since then, we've refined them to 11 feet. So we, we slimmed them down. Uh, I think there were comments along the way that uh, people thought they should be slimmer. So now they are, and there's good reason to be. Uh, we pulled back the, the main tapestry to expose the education building on both sides so that somebody coming, passing by sees it and it creates a more generous um, entrance on, on each side. The tapestries perpendicular to the main tapestry into Independence Avenue seem more appropriate in creating a, a space in the garden and, and then closing it. The imagery of the tapestry has been a lot, lot, of, lot of time, a lot of discussion. Uh, we've had Eisenhower experts, as you know, Lou Galumbos, who's the preeminent Eisenhower scholar, and others. Uh, discussing over and over what the appropriate imageries were. We started out very early and before we landed in the competition, uh, before we presented the final competition, with an image of the Normandy beachhead, which is quite a beautiful image. Uh, along the way, that seemed to be focusing Eisenhower on war, and he was much more than that in his own memoirs. He, uh, he doesn't downplay it, but he, he's uncomfortable with war as we all are. So uh, more and more we realized that this was a man who feel, felt his roots from Abilene, Kansas. Even though he wasn't born there, he talked about it uh, all the time. In his Guildhall speech in London, he mentioned Abilene several times. Um, we went there, we saw the site, we spent time, and it had a resonance for this man's core and essence as a, his humility, his uh, sense of where he came from, the heartland of America, uh, 400 miles from the geographic center of the, the United States. And it was so compelling to us that we explored this idea on the tapestry. Uh, the trees are sycamore trees from, that um, are, are in native to Abilene, and by the way, are very uh, comfortable in Washington, D.C. Um, the The idea of um, adding to his uh, uh, story the issue of Eisenhower the soldier, Eisenhower the president, <laughs> is very much on our minds. And uh, we've focused on the Guildhall speech and his final uh, speech uh, when he left the presidency. Uh, we're working with Lou Columbus and our advisors uh, 
to determine just how we should represent that. We've shown, uh, we have the uh, uh, pictures of him with the soldiers, with his, his men, which is very compelling. And we have pictures of him as uh, giving speeches as the president. Um, we played with, we tried 10 or 12 or more of the obvious things one does when you do set up a photograph like this. Uh, we explored his image on those tapestries. We explored his image as a soldier. As a, and none of them had, uh, had the resonance uh, that this had for this site, for this time, this place. And so we focused on solving the issues of the tapestry, uh, the imagery of the tapestry, and then how to represent Eisenhower. And in his speech, when he returned to Abilene, he talks with very modest humility, etc. He doesn't go in and blow his horn about, I'm the great guy that solved all these things. He talks about the barefoot boy who went on this odyssey, and my God, what an odyssey it was, and, and what I've experienced, and it was so beautifully written. And, and I still come back here, still thinking myself as the boy, barefoot boy from Abilene. We searched through the photographs, and we found uh, this one photograph of him. I don't know how old he was, but the young Eisenhower. And we're exploring the possibility of, of making a three-dimensional uh, representation of that that will sit in kind of the center of the, the main tapestry on a block, which will have this, the, the uh, carved in the stone, the speech, the barefoot boy from Abilene, and uh, this image or something like it. Uh, and we've been exploring how to make that and who makes it and, and we're well down the way to, to getting there. So it's uh, not just another bronze statue so that it has resonance and, and feeling to it. And that's what we hope to achieve. The issue of the military Eisenhower and the President Eisenhower, we have several locations to place that. Uh, we, we analyzed putting them in these gardens so they'd be separate. Uh, the idea that you separate those issues seems to lead to three memorials instead of one, and we're very focused on that. Um, I lived through Larry Halpern's years on the Roosevelt Memorial, and it did get it became an, uh, episodic and different. It has a beautiful garden. Uh, we were tr trying to emulate um, the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, it's very simple. There's a statue of the man. He happens to be in a Greek temple. but uh, And his sayings next to him. And it's so powerful when you reduce this to a minimal statement that we're struggling with where to put these other images and how to do them. I'm, I'm hoping they will be centralized in, the, in this area so you don't have to walk around that the garden is the garden. It's a place people can come and uh, experience the garden and, and uh, use it as a garden and not hit them over the head with a lot of stuff that they have to look at and read. They can plug into their iPhones or their iPads and sit and contemplate his speeches, hear him making the speeches. So we think the, the modern techniques uh, overcome the need to pummel people with information. They can get it, they can enjoy it, and they get it perfectly. Um, the, we're exploring using the stone relief idea for the images of Eisenhower as the president, Eisenhower as the military, which we showed in earlier, earlier 
that one, which is a very strong one. And it's more difficult to make an image of him as the president. Uh, we're, we're looking for a better one. There is one with him at the, at the Globe. Do you have that one? No? I guess you don't. Anyway, he's standing with the Globe of the World, but it seems a little over the top for his personality. <laughs> so uh, we like these two images because they seem to represent him more carefully. So you can see it's a, it's a struggle to define this as an essence and to keep the sense of a whole and the park and to, um, what other slides do I have? I don't remember. Um, and the, the finding the way to make this tapestry, and this is just one way. There are examples here being made on the jacquard loom. The issue is getting the transparency. And when we found a way to do it in a handmade way, uh, that it particularly took it into an, a, an art form <laughs> instead of a photograph. And as we work on it, we plan to, to uh, get less and less photographic. But the transparency of it is what we're counting on to, so that it won't be overwhelming. It'll be part of the park. It'll be transparent. You'll see the buildings behind them. Uh, and the image will be there. And so finally, the modesty will be this young boy and, uh, the ref and whatever the references are to the military and the president, sort of focused in the center in a very modest way. And the, and the park and the tapestries will be backgrounds. And I think it'll, the tapestry at night has an interesting uh, persona and it changes with the light and we'll be able to, uh, we're planning to work on the lighting of this park so that it can be used for events to celebrate uh, events in Eisenhower's life. And uh, we've created a terrace, as you can see, where uh, speeches could be given and, and used as a focal point for events in the park. The one more, probably very important issue is the cartway to the Capitol. And uh, we've made it, uh, <laughs> this is Einstein Walk at Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies where I just spent uh, some time and this is Fold Hall, and the president's house to Fold Hall is uh, an alley like this. Now, in our case, these will be further apart, as you can see, and create, but not pave it, make it part of the garden. So it's from the, from the street side, you look out, you, you get the, the um, view of the Capitol, very strong, and, uh, the changes we made, moving this tapestry, pulling back, widened the opening uh, to the to the Capitol. So it, we listened to the critique of the past uh, uh, meetings, and uh, we feel very comfortable that this uh, addresses those issues. I'm sure we'll have, in the spirit of Eisenhower, we're going to have. We're going to listen as much as we can. Uh, we know that there are differences of opinion on all of these issues, and as best we can, we're happy to listen to them. Thank you. Craig, Craig Webb, my partner, is going to go through the detail and address the uh, seven, what are they called? Seven principles. Seven uh, principles that were. Thank you. Um, my name is Craig Webb. I'm a partner with Frank Geary. Um, so what I would like to do is firstly present the difference between the plan that you saw last and the current plan, and then go through an explanation of how we're addressing uh, the seven principles that are key um, to the planning of, of the uh, memorial. So the plan on the left side is the um, 
is the plan we presented last time. Let's see if I can get the pointer working. Uh, so you see here. Um, the key differences and the changes that we've made in response to the comments that we've had have to do firstly with the tapestry itself, the main portion of which has been shortened by one bay. Um, the intent of that is to allow more prominence to the LBJ education building. Um, the second ch major change is to turn the two flanking tapestry elements from their position parallel to Independence Avenue to being perpendicular to the street. Um, we feel this has accomplished a couple things. One, it's created more of a welcoming opening into the site itself. Um, it frames and creates a much more coherent public space. Um, and it creates more transparency to the LBJ building itself because in this design, in portions, you're looking through two layers of tapestry and in this design, only one layer of tapestry. So the transparency of, the, um, of that tapestry is really important. Another key aspect is that in the previous design, the Maryland axis was paved and in the current design, we're proposing a green space in the center of the site. So the proportion of green and lawn space uh, has greatly increased in the new design. Um, we, uh, there's a much clearer definition of the Maryland axes um, with the street trees, which are actually, uh, these trees are in alignment with the street trees on either side of the site. I'm gonna show you an image later on that shows that alignment. Um, and then benches and other architectural elements are gonna define the edges of the historic cartway, the 50 foot width. Um, so moving, let's see if I can get this to work now. So this is the previous design, so I'll just reiterate the main points being the, the shortening of the main tapestry, the turning of these two elements, um, and the, the uh, creating a green space in the center. So this is a view of the last design we presented to you, and you can see the, the kind of double layering effect of the tapestry elements there. Uh, this is the new design, and as you can see, um, this green space in the center. Another benefit of this design is that the support building, which had previously been within the memorial precinct itself, now sits outside of the space that's defined by the tapestry, so we feel like that creates a much uh, more appropriate, serene space without interruptions of uh, that support building. And this is an image... Um, uh, of the current design proposal. You can see the tapestry element framing this public space. Uh, the transparency of the, the tapestry itself, um, which I think in this uh, rendition is actually a little more opaque than the actual. Uh, the images of the mock-up of the tapestry, I think, um, show that there's actually a lot more transparency in the sky element. Uh, so I just want to go through, firstly, the design principles that have focused our design, and then I'll come to the principles, uh, the planning issues. Uh, the first, first one I want to talk about is the, uh, is the prominence of the Maryland uh, Avenue axes. And we feel that, and I think everyone would agree, that this is a fairly ill-defined axis at this point, particularly as it moves further west. We think that the design of the memorial is really going to strengthen the Maryland axes uh, in an important way, both creating a great public green space but also helping to frame views and organize um, the Maryland axes. And so part of the driver to the reconfiguration of the tapestry is to create a wider opening that frames views of the Capitol and also to center the Capitol uh, in that view axis. So previously, the, the view of the Capitol, the columns were framing it in an in a asymmetrical way. Now it's a very symmetrical framed view. And we've spread the columns out so there's now 92 feet between uh, the columns on either side of that view shed. Uh, you can see here um, the view from the west side looking toward the Capitol. Um, one of the elements we think is working quite well is that the trees form a very kind of humanistic lower level garden space. The tapestry steps up framing the space and then the buildings are the highest elements. So the tapestry is actually lower than any of the adjacent buildings. Um, it's, it's lower both than the education building um, and every single building surrounding the site. It's, it's actually the lowest element on the site. Um, the Maryland Avenue Cartway is an, a very important part of the design. So we feel that creating 
an open space in the center of the Maryland axes rather than placing an object in, on that center line is really important. And we feel like green space is really uh, key to creating um, a very pleasant garden space. And again, I'll just reiterate um, this uh, image from Princeton Institute, the Einstein LA, is, um, shows a more manicured lawn in the center and then rougher uh, grass and landscape. I'll go into the landscape a bit further. And it, as, we, as Frank said, the trees in this LA will be spread further apart to really frame uh, views of the Capitol. Um, just a bit on dimensions. Um, as I said, the, there's the 50-foot cartway, which is the center of the Maryland Avenue axes. These two columns are now 92 feet apart, um, framing that view. The 50-foot separation from the LBJ building is respected, and none of the memorial elements come into that 50-foot space. The space from the facade of LBJ to the face of the tapestry is 74 feet currently. There's been quite a bit of discussion on the Independence Avenue right-of-way and building lines. I'm going to go into that in a lot of detail later. But this particular column um, has been in a lot of discussion. I want to point out the fact that it sits well outside of the, uh, it sits 16 feet outside of the Independence 110-foot right-of-way, and it is 32 feet from the curb line. It's actually well inside of the, of the, the 20-foot sidewalk that we are um, proposing along Independence Avenue. Again, this is a, uh, showing a closer view, the frame <coughs> view of the Capitol, this kind of stair-stepping from landscape to columns up to building heights. Uh, and this also shows um, a view down the promenade, which is the space that we hope in cooperation with the Education Department to really create active uses within that space. I'll talk about that in a minute also. Um, so in order to create, and I think one of the main values, one of the key principles of design that we've been given is to create a separate, distinct um, outdoor public space that would be a gathering space, a, g a great garden space, and a space that memorializes uh, President Eisenhower. So the columns and the tapestry are really key to creating the identity of that space. Um, and you, you can see framed here, this, this uh, we've studied the, the tree canopy both in the summertime and the wintertime. So this, this is a view in the summertime, which shows what the tree canopy will, will be like. But I think you can see that this um, colonnade and tapestry really um, create the frame for a very organized public space. And the tapestry itself, which is um, a landscape idea about, which, which we feel um, epitomizes the values of General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, his roots, the source of his personal journey to bring a piece of the center of America into the nation's capital we think will be a very powerful uh, image. And so this is, um, shows how that um, tapestry will wrap the space. Um, another key change from the previous design are the, the fourth and sixth street um, spaces. So by pulling these tapestry elements in from the curb line of 4th and 6th Street, and by, by creating a green zone on either side, we feel like we're creating a better buffer between, uh, be between the Wilbur Wright building on this side and the Cohen building on the other side. It really places the street in the center of the space more than, and so by pulling these back, <coughs> we feel like the street space is, space is really being respected. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute how views of the LBJ building are created there. So you can see the, spa the street space is created on either side and then a bit of more compression of the, um, of the memorial uh, core itself. Uh, this would be the 4th Street Vista. So you can see um, the Cohen building on this side, the corner of LBJ, and then the tapestry. And then on the other side, on 6th Street, corner of LBJ, the Wilbur Wright building off to this side. Uh, this diagram shows from these important intersections of, of 6th Street and 4th Street the view shed to the corner of the LBJ building. Um, also the greater transparency um, through to LBJ 
because of the transparency of the tapestry, <laughs> as well as views out of the LBJ building through the tapestry. And we've spent quite a bit of time uh, with people from the Department of Education. We've gone up into their spaces with the mock-up placed uh, at the appropriate dimension from the building, and the transparency is actually working quite well based on the mock-up. A little bit about the columns themselves. So the columns are, their functionality is to support the tapestry. And the tapestry, as you might imagine, needs to be stretched so that it provides a very flat image, um, which means that the tapestry is in a lot of tension. It's, a, it's set on a cable net. Um, the, the end columns are the ones that are really taking the load. You can see the columns on either side. The, the tapestry is really tensioned between the two of those. And the concrete that is required to support that tension um, requires a nine foot in diameter concrete column. Um, the nine foot in diameter then um, we clad with limestone. Um, we're, we're still exploring different materials, but limestone is the, is the key. And so you can see uh, the idea of a horizontal banding of the, uh, the individual blocks of limestone and then the vertical banding like that. So we have reduced the diameter of the column from 12 feet to 11 feet which is the minimum dimension that we can bring the cladding in. It allows us one foot on e either side of the concrete to clad the column. So 11 feet is about the minimum uh, diameter that we can go to. Uh, you can see in this, in this diagram that we have aligned the top of the tapestry with the lowest cornice line on the LBJ building, um, which helps to associate the tapestry and, and create a better relationship for that building. And you can see here um, that alignment with that lowest um, step on the LBJ building. In terms of pedestrian circulation on the site, um, pedestrians will definitely enter from the corners. That's where people will cross the street and coming from adjacent sides and also from, uh, from the southerly corners. Um, we have created raised landscape on these two corners to direct the pedestrian traffic so that the landscaping doesn't get trampled as people enter the site. Uh, and we're bringing people through a paved opening on these two corners under tapestry elements which act as gateways in, uh, as entry points into the, into the central core of the memorial uh, and then pathways that allow them to circulate. And as Frank was saying earlier, these memorial elements, we're considering bringing them together more into the center of the site. So I think as the design develops, we're going to really uh, start to focus um, into this central core of the um, memorial. We intend to move this design along and bring back um, to this commission prior to our final submission on October 28th um, a more finalized design of the central area. So we're, we're not quite done yet, but we will uh, bring that design back to you before our final submission. In terms of landscape, one of the main goals of the project is to create a very beautiful public garden. And that has to do with the landscape of the site. So the predominance of green space here is really key to this, which is why the Maryland axis has been uh, changed into a green walkway. Um, the tree canopy, which will provide shade um, and create a very pleasant environment under that canopy with spaces for people to sit and enjoy the landscape, that, that's the kind of uh, garden space that we're trying to create. The main species of tree um, is the sycamore tree, which is native both to Kansas, which is the landscape that we're evoking both in tapestry and in the landscape design itself, um, will be the predominant tree. And that's the ones that you see circled in red here. Um, and then the rest of the tree canopy will be large canopy deciduous trees, mainly uh, different types of oak trees um, that will give us a variation so that we don't have a, just a monolithic culture of trees on the site. The understory will be predominantly turf, so the Maryland axis itself will be the most manicured and most often uh, mowed portion. And then there are areas around that that will be a little taller grass, but also mowed grass, so most of the site is mowed. These areas that you see in yellow are swales, which are a, uh, a depression in the land, which is, is present in the Kansas landscape. Uh, it's where a lot of different uh, plant cultures, because of the water ponds in these areas, 
So we're creating those swales on the site, and those will uh, be depressed by 18 inches or two feet, and we'll, the landscaping in those will be taller grasses and other uh, perennial plants, so that we're getting a variation. It's not just going to be a big lawn. There's going to be quite a bit of variation in, in height and scale of um, plant material. Keeping in mind visibility on the site is really important for security. There's, there's not going to be large hedges or anything like that, but the, but the variation in the grasses on there is, is really important. Um, I talked a little bit about, this is the promenade, so here's LBJ, this is the tapestry across this side. Um, one of the key goals in, in developing the space, which is actually fairly uh, inactive at this point, would be to create different activities. So the center uh, portion, which is a piece that's really shared between the education building and the memorial site, has an overlook. So this is three feet above the main memorial site, and there's a kind of uh, wall and overlook there forms uh, a public gathering space. There's a glass canopy that covers this space, so in inclement weather it's a very good, going to be a very good place both to view the memorial site, but it also gives people a place to meet, and these are the two entries to the LBJ building itself. Um, this space is available for public events and just for uh, kind of gathering and orientation. The space on the left side, um, we, we had a, a design workshop with, with uh, members of the Department of Education. One idea to be explored here is to create a place for um, the Department of Education to do community outreach and to, to present their programming in a very public way in this space. Um, on the other side, the, their existing cafe sits there and the idea of creating outdoor dining um, along that edge is another idea we're exploring. So we, we're continuing a dialogue with the Department of Education. We're actually meeting with, uh, later this afternoon with them. So now I'd like to quickly go through the seven principles that have been given to us and just talk about how we've addressed each of those. Um, the first principle is to create reciprocal views um, to and from the Capitol. So this is a view from Reservation 113 looking toward the Capitol building. Uh, you can see the kind of stair-stepping of landscape, which in our experience in Washington is that most of the views get framed by trees. Um, they are the predominant uh, element closest to the sidewalk, closest to pedestrians. The tapestry then steps up and centers that view of the Capitol, and then the buildings form a kind of bigger scale sidewalls to that view. And then looking back, this is a really this is from one of the upper steps on the Capitol. You can see the viewpoint here. It's pretty amazing to see how green that uh, Maryland axis is currently. I mean, this is a current photograph. Um, and then you can see that the the tapestry elements are helping to, to frame what could become in the future uh, a much enhanced Maryland axis as it goes further to the west. There's a lot of challenges to creating that, but we think that this memorial site can really set up views looking to the west and ho hopefully encourage what goes on in the future. Um, second principle is to create a sequence of uh, public spaces. So this is the Eisenhower Memorial Site here, the Capitol off in this direction. Um, Reservation 113, which is a very compromised green public space currently, could become the next in this kind of string of pearls along that axis. I think there's potential here, but it's a, it's a huge challenge to um, get to that. And then the rail line interrupts the view, and that creates an even greater challenge to create the westerly extension of the, of the axis. But we think this is um, going to be a really important first step to start to focus um, that, that activity. Uh, the third is to create an integrated site. Um, and so step one is to take out the roadway. And as you can see, the combination of kind of modern traffic planning, which requires left turn, right turn lanes, parking, and so on, occupies a huge part of that site. So by taking the roadways out, unifying it as a single parcel, and then creating a green space, goes a long way towards making um, that kind of space. And here's a view, so you, once again you see the tapestry framing the space um, and the Maryland axis coming through. Again, I'll just reiterate the idea of the relationship of the surrounding buildings is really important, and so then creating these green spaces on either side in respect um, to, the, to the Wilbur Wright building and the Cohen building are important. The image down here shows the Air and Space Museum on this side. And um, this is just 
the tapestry columns and tapestry superimposed over the existing site, but I think it shows the way the Air and Space Building really becomes the fourth side of this great public space. Um, part and parcel with creating the physical part of that is to create the idea of creating a precinct. And the Eisenhower legacy that Carl talked about earlier engages each of the surrounding buildings. And so the idea that the memorial um, associates President Eisenhower's uh, participation in air and space, um, the FAA, education, and health and uh, human services, we think that the, that the memorial will really create a neighborhood, a precinct, um, and draw all those buildings together in a way that they do, do not currently relate to each other. Um, so in relationship to the L'Enfant Plan, which is, I think, been, there's been a huge amount of discussion about exactly what that plan implies and how it uh, functions in this area. Um, the L'Enfant Plan did not specifically call for a public square at this position, but I think that the events that have taken place with the position of the rail line and so on, I think the opportunity to create one of those spaces on this site presents itself in a way that could happen now and not wait for a long time in the future. So by combining the parcels, we think that this becomes the type of public square that, that is inherent in the L'Enfant Plan. And the creation of um, the space as a, as a temple, as an architectural uh, you know, a space in the city with the green space in the center. So it's not, it's not like many of the other L'Enfant squares with a statue or a building in the center. It's a frame space that's green space. So we think that's really appropriate and uh, a different type of space that fits well into that plan. Uh, I've talked already about the relationship to the LBJ building. Um, to activate this as a public space is really uh, important in, um, in responding to, to the principle number four that we were looking at. Um, in discussions about how we reflect the architecture of the, of the surrounding buildings, um, each of these buildings has a very separate, distinct architectural character to them. Um, from you know, modernism and uh, historical building here, the new uh, Museum for American Indians, the, this is a very diverse set of buildings, Kevin Roach's um, Air and Space Museum. The idea of using the tapestry as a, as a kind of diaphanous membrane, a very light, translucent um, piece, we think can really start to create a, um, a public square out of this space and really work to relate the buildings one to another. Um, as I said previously, this element, you can see it's lower than each of these buildings, so it gives you views around it. Uh, but it also helps to, I think, frame them and, um, and create a coherence out of this space. Uh, just to reiterate again, the, the idea of um, the stepping from landscape to tapestry to buildings is, is really important uh, in, that, in that linking of those buildings together. This diagram just shows the heights of the adjacent buildings, but as I said before, the 80 feet of, in height of the tapestry itself is lower than each of these buildings surrounding. I'm not gonna go through the heights, but the, it, this diagram um, shows that. Um, I'd like to now talk about uh, the principle of building lines and view sheds, um, which is really critical to the planning of the cap nation's capital. Um, Firstly, I've, I've already talked about dimensions here, and I want to get into a little more detail on that. So the 92 feet uh, of the view shed of the Maryland Avenue axes we think is, is really important. The width of the cartway and the framing of those views is important. This diagram shows the relationship of the street, of the trees on either side of the Maryland axes in relationship to the street trees uh, on either side. So there's a definite alignment and a continuity of of landscape elements which will really strengthen the Maryland axes. In terms of the independence street wall, or I would say lack of street wall, um, I'd like to just <coughs> talk a little bit about what goes on. And this shows the full length of independence uh, within the neighborhood starting 
um, with the agriculture department, which actually has bridges that cross the street and uh, frame a very interesting kind of plaza space in the center there, but also um, create kind of a portal coming into, into this part of the street heading toward the Capitol. And then you can see the buildings step back and forth pretty radically. Um, a lot of the older buildings um, are the closest to the, uh, to the sidewalk. <coughs> I can get this to change. Um, so here's the agriculture department. These older, more historical buildings, this one is actually 16 feet from the curb line. So they really crowd in. And you can see the street wall moves back and forth. Some of the more uh, modernist buildings step quite a distance back from the curb line. Um, the Hirshhorn is a, becomes an object in itself with, with no street wall, but becomes uh, a kind of spatial definer there, uh, and, so, and so on and so on. So the issue of what happens in terms of street wall in this site, uh, this one column is not radically different from a lot of the back and forth stepping that happens uh, as you move down Independence Avenue. This just shows um, further down near the Capitol. So again, I just want to reiterate that this column is outside of the legally defined Independence Avenue right-of-way and also well back from both the curb line and from the edge of the sidewalk sitting in, in the gardened green space of the site. Uh, the, the, final, um, the final principle that we think we've paid very close attention to would be to create a public green space. Um, I've talked a lot about that, so just to reiterate, this uh, we see as a very important public garden in Washington, D.C. Um, so I would like to uh, conclude by saying that we believe we've listened and that we've really complied with uh, the principles that have been put before us. We will come back to you very shortly um, with a final design for the center of the Memorial Corps. I just wanted to uh, um, make one uh, observation. In the model photographs, the opening uh, uh, to, the, to the Maryland Cartway is exaggerated vertically, and so I urge you to come and look at it on the model because it's wider in actual uh, perception when you look at it on the model. Thank you, Mr. Gary, Mr. Webb. Uh, very good presentation. Um, <clears throat> we appreciate you walking us through how the design has progressed uh, since we last gathered in February. At this point, uh, there may be some questions among commission members, so um, let me turn it inward. Uh, Mr. Goning. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of comments, so I'll just kind of go through it. Um, uh, first, let me say, uh, uh, you know, I got a chance a month ago, I guess, to be with my fellow commissioners to see the prototypes of the tapestry um, and how that was kind of being developed. And I honestly thought it was dazzling. I mean, I thought it was just beautiful. And, and uh, you know, Mr. Gary, I know that is something that you're really known for, your innovation in materials. And I thought that was, it was incredibly beautiful and, and, and really a wonderful innovation. I, I, I really loved it. Okay, that being said, um, the problem with Southwest is that it's, it, it has an overbearing scale. And that this, you know, and a lot of what this commission is trying to do with some of its efforts uh, with the Southwest Eco District and some of the other plans is to actually try to humanize that scale. And I think that this is exacerbating rather than, than contributing to that humanization. Yes, the screens are diaphanous. The columns are still really gargantuan. Um, you know, and the, and the whole design is supersized. And the relationship of the L'Enfant streets, a normal, uh, you know, L'Enfant street is a 90-foot width. Um, this avenue is 160 feet, um, and the avenues are intended to create these wonderful views. So in some ways, we are kind of making the, the, the view of the Capitol a, a much more ordinary, and, and I use the term maybe not so uh, well, pedestrian, because I want to get back to pedestrians. 
but but you know we make the we make that view so much more ordinary than I think it needs to be. Um, I think that uh, our historic preservation officers talked a little bit, maybe to some of the your, your folks, about some specific suggestions in terms of that spacing. Uh, you were you you successfully went from an uh, uh, an 80 foot column um, space 92 feet apart. Um, you know, I, I think what, what I'd love to see is a 70-foot column uh, spaced 105 feet apart. Uh, that would give you a one-and-a-half to one ratio. Right now we have essentially in this area 80-foot buildings uh, and a 160-foot right-of-way, which is a two-to-one ratio, which is, I, I think, more something that would be more appropriate here. In terms of scale, I'll just point out that the lower blocks of the Air and Space Museum are 68 feet. Uh, the, the columns at, at the Cohen building are 71 feet. So getting from 80 to 70, I think, would actually help with the scale of this memorial. Um, let me see, what else did I want to say? That, that I think it's very impressive to see the models. I think they're wonderful. But uh, the, the comment that the commission members have made, I think, repeatedly is that we'd love to see, even in the photographs, more of the perspective of the park user. If you're in the park, how does the scale feel to you? What are the facilities for you, the user of the park? I mean, I think this is a, you know, every, every view that we see gives you a perspective that you'll never have of this memorial. You'll, you'll very rarely have it because, you know, uh, you, you can't get from this perspective. The, the, the space making, the place making um, is, is actually in the side of the memorial itself, and it'd be wonderful to see some perspectives of what that is like. Um, and 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 as much as I think that the 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 screens and the materials you're using are so beautiful, I, I do know that from 20 feet up, I'm I'm losing a lot of the detail. I'm not getting the craftsmanship, the incredible, the miracle of this thing that you've produced because it's it starts 20 feet in the air and then and then goes up, you know, 60 feet, um, and and it's hard to, to kind of get those details. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I particularly want to see is the, is what is it from the, you know, user's perspective? Uh, you know, the, the pedestrians look dwarfed in that space in this model for a good reason, I think. So, so just to get a sense of what are you doing for the, the, the people who are going to be in the memorial, where are they sitting? You know, what, you know, what is, what is their experience of being in this space that you're creating? You mentioned the cafeteria. I'll just make a point about that. Um, uh, GSA uh, is here, and they're doing some really marvelous things that the commission, I know, is very supportive of, making more of the federal facilities accessible to the public and are pl have plans to do that with their own cafeteria uh, in their remodeled headquarters. I would hope that if the uh, Department of Education is going to be talking about using part of this design to activate the public space, that they would also consider making that cafeteria accessible to the public. Uh, in those other places in, this, in, uh, in the monumental part of the city where there is a, uh, like, like the uh, sculpture garden, where there is a, a place where you can eat and, and have a very convivial meal, it is very much uh, uh, an enlivening uh, asset. If, if it's something you can only press your nose to the glass and, and see other people eating uh, uh, and, and, and having refreshments, but because you don't have a federal ID, you can't do that, uh, not, so, not so enlivening, really. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Mr. May, did you have? Um, I just had general comments. I mean, I've obviously been very close to the process of development of the memorial. Um, and uh, I just want to emphasize for the benefit of the commission how difficult a design challenge it is working on this particular site. I mean, it is just a hugely complicated thing. It's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's not a, not a well-defined space. It has all these roads running through it. Um, it's, it. It's so wide open. And it, trying to make some definition of it, I think, is just such a huge challenge. And I appreciate all the work that has gone into um, designing the memorial to address things to both on a large scale but on a small scale as well. Um, I would also say that since we saw this last, um, there has been a, uh, I think, a substantial change that has resulted from a series of smaller changes. I mean, the, the, the loss of one column, the turning of the, of the two uh, tapestry panels, uh, and so on. And I don't know that that necessarily comes through in the presentation, but I think the net effect is 
that um, the uh, the memorial design and the features of it, I think, fit much more comfortably and address the uh, uh, the design guidelines. I think, for the most part, very effectively. Um, I also would agree that the, the the really big move, the the dazzling aspect of this, is the development of the tapestry, and um, I was fairly uh, concerned, I think, from the very beginning about how effective that would be and how much that could change the nature of this design um, or sort of prove the design. But I think that what we've seen in the samples that are that are here and the samples that we saw on site um, prove that the tapestry is uh, is a potentially a, a very, very exciting feature and uh, uh, demonstrates an artistry and, uh, and an appropriateness for the for what's being attempted here that, that uh, uh, I, I actually find quite surprising and, and delightful. So I'm, I, I think that was the really big development since we were here last. Um, the, uh, uh, the result is, I think, that there has been exceptional progress over the last several months. Uh, I do know there is more work that needs to be done. There's more work to be done from the Park Service's perspective because as much as I love the tapestry, we want to make sure that it's maintainable and, and uh, permanent in the long run. Um, we have to, uh, uh, we go to great lengths to maintain our memorials and uh, have to withstand uh, uh, many different conditions. Some of them are surprising, like earthquakes. Um, fortunately, this I don't think is going to have issues if there's another earthquake, but uh, um, we have responsibility for maintaining everything uh, uh, more or less forever. And so we want to make sure that it passes the forever test. Um, so we will be continue to work with the design team to make sure that that happens. Um, with regard to the, the uh, further development of the design, um, I think that's, uh, that's all happening, and I'm confident that we will get to uh, a, uh, a, a completion point that will be satisfactory for this commission and for the other commissions and for Section 106 consulting parties and so on. So thanks. Other discussion, Mr. Hart? Uh, I also was able to to view the mock-ups of this uh, this tapestry last month, and I was struck with the progression of a notion from a photographic uh, representation to something that's a lot more sculptural and true artwork in its own. Uh, that being said, uh, from the very beginning, I've expressed a concern about putting uh, anything of this scale in the street right of way. And there are four of these enormous columns in the Maryland Avenue right of way uh, that I think uh, begin to obstruct that. It narrows the right of way from 160 feet of clear view to 90 feet. Uh, and I find that disturbing, uh, much in the way that uh, Commissioner Trigoning, uh described in making the street um, less monumental. Um, I do applaud, uh, appreciate the fact that uh, that view shed is being framed by trees uh, that continue the, uh, the LA along the Maryland Avenue axis opening up towards the Capitol. And I, I think that the addition and emphasis of a garden uh, treatment of the plaza is going to be a welcome uh, addition. I'm still looking, though, for the connection to Eisenhower. I, I'm not uh, seeing the, the celebration of the man and his contribution in uh, depiction of a rural landscape, which is really uh, you know, very much the central theme on the, the tapestry. And I, at the last point is that uh, I see that the, the support building is being moved out of the central plaza, and I, I applaud that. As a matter of fact, I would take it off the table entirely if it was in my power. I don't think it's appropriate uh, or a positive uh, addition to this, uh, this design concept. Uh, so if GSA were willing to help you know, accommodate some of those functions, I think that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Provencher? With the approval of the chairman, are, is the uh, Department of Education representatives that are here today, would they be allowed to share their perspectives? 
I don't see why but not. I think the, the, sure. the partnership, the communication, the collaboration between the Eisenhower Commission and the, their neighbors yes, sir. Would, would be relevant. Is anyone here from DOE who Ms. would? Ms. Weiss, Mr. McGrath, not here today? Okay. Okay. My name is Dan File. I'm executive architect with the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Uh, Mr. Geary and my commission have a meeting with um, Joanne Weiss, the chief of staff, and Secretary Duncan at 2, uh, two o'clock, if we have concluded by then, if not a few minutes later, uh, here in your training room. So we are uh, talking with them, and uh, I think that we're getting to a better place. We'll see. Did a group recently go from the NCMAC to meet with the education folks. I chatted with Mr. McGrath earlier in the week. He's the Assistant Secretary for Community, basically right. Public Affairs. Uh, was there we, a separate meeting? There was a, a, a Chief, Ms. Weiss went down and viewed the uh, same mock-ups that you did. Okay. She also went inside and viewed them from inside the building out, inside. as I believe you folks did. Mm -hmm. We, uh, My commission met with um, her deputy, Eric Waldo, I think about a week ago with John McGrath. And uh, that's when we all agreed that the two of them plus Joanne would be coming to see the model. They've not seen the model before. Mm -hmm. They've seen the mock-ups. And uh, okay. it seems that we're, we're as I say, I think we're, we're moving in a good direction. Mm -hmm. In their absence, if I might be permitted, I could share the gist of Mr. McGrath's conversation with me of uh, Tuesday of this week. They uh, considered, continue to be concerned about the relationship between the building and the memorial. The promenade has some concerns. The tapestry, the sight lines, the view from outside the building, the lighting into the building. He used the term shrouding the building was, the again, his, his terminology. Uh, he did acknowledge that some of the issues had been mitigated. He talked about the shortened uh, span of the tapestry. The uh, images that uh, that they have now seen in the mock-ups are were more translucent than they originally had uh, had uh, been led to believe. The reorientation of the smaller tapestries was also uh, notable. It was very helpful for them to uh, to see the, as it was for the commissioners to make the site visit and look at the mock-ups. See uh, distance between the tapestry and the building, the height. Um, they became though more comfortable. I'm just. This were my notes as our conversation proceeded. Um, he described the rank and file in the education uh, building as not being crazy about the columns. However, their leadership, uh, the message that they have taken away is that uh, this is inevitable. Um, you need to get on board. They seem to believe that the uh, commissioners on both the NCMAC and NCPC are pleased with the design. Um, they um, were pleased with things like the uh, um, support for uh, for visitors. They uh, were led to believe that their building and their plaza was uh, was not remarkable, and part of the function of the tapestry was to hide quote an ugly building. Obviously, that's a, in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes clear and clean and simple and functional are, is also attractive. They were respectful of the uh, intent to design the plaza as a theater. One of the things that they was important to them was to respect, while they had acknowledged that they're a tenant in the building, they're also a cabinet agency, and they have a, a very important uh, mission. Um, so that was the, the gist of, uh, of his uh, comments to me. The specific ones that I have, I echo and Could support I, uh, the comments. Could I please address some of those comments? Certainly. Uh, when we met with Mr. McGrath and, uh, on previous occasions, he told us that somewhere between s less than 20 people uh, sent him e emails regarding their comments on the tapestry and mm -hmm. how they felt about the project. Uh, there are a 1,000 people in the building. Uh, it didn't seem... Uh, in any way conclusive that the 20 emails were representative of everyone. We've asked uh, where it all comes from, and it's all anecdotal. Mm -hmm. when, so I'll offer my anecdote. My commission received five or six emails on our website from people who are at the Department of Ed. 
and some of them were rather vocal and unkind and unpleasantly worded. One, after the tapestry went up, the very next morning, a, the same woman call, wrote us another email and apologized and said, I'm very sorry, I spoke the way I did, my language was off, the tone was wrong, and it's going to be beautiful, thank you. Excellent. When we were up on the floor looking out on the tapestry, a worker right in front of the glass said, I want to meet the architect. I just think it's great. I can see it. It's a tree. I can see through it. So there are anecdotes on both sides, but it's, I don't, we didn't get, we weren't told from Mr., by Mr. Uh, Waldo or by Ms. Weiss that they felt this was inevitable. It seemed to be more moving in the direction of it is acceptable to us now and we would like to develop the promenade so that we can really get something out of this more than even the space itself, we want to activate it. And that's why I asked her to come and see the model and she agreed because I think you really, to understand it as, as Frank said before, you need to get up and walk around it and look at Certainly. it. So we're thrilled that she's coming and we're very optimistic that we will wind up in a better place. Uh, and hopefully if they feel that way, the, the department will be able to commit to you formally what their position is rather than this anecdotal. I, I asked them about that because their formal position was uh, February this year, multiple concerns signed out Correct. per the memo of Mr. Duncan. Correct. I asked Mr. McGrath specifically about that. Subsequent to your meetings, and, and I perhaps have laid out the agenda for your meeting this afternoon if they're consistent with the concerns that were raised. But uh, I asked him specifically, will there be a follow-on memo with your latest and newest uh, position? And he could not, obviously, on behalf of the secretary, make that commitment, but it's, uh, but it's being uh, considered. Appreciate your, your response on the anecdotal information. Again, uh, my source was Mr. McGrath of uh, 48 hours ago. Uh, one of the things that he was concerned about, uh, somehow or another, he's gotten the impression on the imaging uh, that's being selected uh, or proposed and considered at this time for the tapestry. With this thing uh, being 20 feet above the ground, it, what it does because of the broad width of the most dense and therefore most opaque band of the uh, earthwork is the folks on the second and third floor, their view out of the building and the light into the building is blocked. One of the suggestions is just to shift the camera angle up a couple of inches so that that band is just a little bit narrower. Uh, going back to the uh, issue of the tapestry, I think it's an incredible, I'm surprised it hasn't been patented already. It uh, is so uh, in innovative. But like some fellow commissioners, uh, again from the operations and maintenance and life cycle perspective, the ability of the, those thousands and thousands, millions. millions of welds and their ability to withstand buffeting of, uh, of winds. Uh, I'm, I, I believe there's some weathering testing uh, <laughs> underway. So hope that would uh, uh, make sure that the, uh, those uh, wells short of sealing them with, uh, and then uh, also uh, uh, cleaning uh, wind-brown debris, um, airborne seeds, uh, bird nests. Uh, <clears throat> it, it would be difficult if you have to hose this thing down either from a crane or some built-in uh, spray jets every night. That would uh, be unfortunate. Um, I think the last point I'd like to cover is just the design principles. Acknowledge that we have seen progress from February to today. <coughs> the seven design principles, there was only compliance for this particular design concept, uh, three, that in February met the least amount of those design principles, only two of seven. There has been progress uh, to date. The two that were met, uh, enhancing the nature of the site, number two, and incorporating green space have been sustained, so that, that's a good thing. There was no, uh, as we say in North Carolina, where I'm from, no, no backsliding, which is, uh, is good. There's at least partial compliance with number three on the uniformed uh, memorial site. There's at least partial compliance on shaping the site, number four, little bit of hesitancy still about uh, uh, complimenting the de Department of Education uh, headquarters. Hopefully, uh, subsequent to your meeting, we'll have good news there. Still have major concerns about five and six respecting complimenting the architecture of the surrounding precinct and the sight lines that have been uh, touched on by the other, uh, other commissioners. So uh, applaud you for the efforts uh, headed in the right direction. Some of the concerns 
remain about scope scale view sheds, both down capital and uh, and reciprocal uh, are uh, still continue to have those. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McGill. Thank you. Um, first of all, in response to Mr. Goning, in the uh, summer of 2001, we put tables and chairs outside the education building so that passers-by could partake of the food and drink in the cafeteria and enjoy the plaza, if it's possible to enjoy that plaza. Um, after 911, those tables and chairs were removed. We certainly share your concern about the importance and need for making our buildings more open and accessible and making people, giving people access to our food services. Um, so uh, that's very important. Uh, second, I'd like to just make a few comments on the design. Um, I, I'm very impressed with the changes and modifications that have been made. Uh, I'm especially impressed with this idea of the outdoor room, and, and now it's more so of an outdoor room because of the rotating of the end panels. Uh, and it seems to me that the outdoor room might be the only way to relate to some of these design principles. Um, you know, I empathize with the architect having to try to res respect the law and font plan when almost all the buildings on Maryland Avenue don't respect the law and font plan. They are situated so that they are parallel to Independence Avenue uh, and they have their and their rec the rectangles not um, not multi-shaped shapes like in the federal triangle and as a result you get this zigzag uh, gap-toothed facade along Maryland Avenue that is a constant source of dismay to me from a design from design principles from the sense of creating a street wall secondly respecting the architecture of the existing buildings surrounding the site is very difficult because the architecture of the existing buildings surrounding the site varies so dramatically and so it seems to me that the outdoor room is one of the few ways those design principles can be complied with. And uh, although this is on a much smaller scale, I can think of an example where this has worked in New Harmony, Indiana, which is a historic community built in the 1810s and 1820s on the banks of um, the Wabash River, I believe, or the White River. Um, the, uh, the village was a utopian community founded by German uh, separatists and it's mainly wood uh, vernacular architecture. And in the middle of this restored, preserved historic site is a roofless church designed by Philip Johnson uh, with four walls and no roof, four low walls and landscaping. And it does a very effective job of fitting into the site yet providing a different contrast to what's there right now. Um, I'm also pleased that the cartway has been shifted from paving to grass. I think that's more respectful of the memorial itself. It integrates the memorial together better while still keeping the sight lines intact. And I like the, the subject matter of the tapestry. Um, Eisenhower was a man of the West. He lo lived beyond the 100th meridian in a fairly severe environment. Um, yet, and he had the optimism and openness of people of the West. <clears throat> Yet he also worked to integrate the East and the West with the interstate highway system. So I think that this is a very appropriate memorial as designed, and I'm impressed with the way they've modified it to comply with these principles. Thank you. Thank you. Any last uh, words? Uh, yes, please. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank uh, all of those uh, who have worked in this uh, noble endeavor. Seeing all of the Ike buttons brings back many fond memories. I have one of those in my office prominently displayed. And it did occur to me when you mentioned the time involved that it exceeds uh, the length of uh, America's involvement in World War II uh, and uh, almost combined with um, uh, Eisenhower's eight years as, as president. I, I'd like to ask, uh, I'm very intrigued by the design and I think it's, uh, it's really uh, in inspiring. Uh, but uh, uh, there are a few aspects uh, I'd like to inquire about. Number one, I personally would be satisfied with just a statue of Eisenhower uh, with uh, different uh, uh, notations on the base, uh, noting his, uh, his, the positions that he held, you know, president and general, and uh, 
presidency of Columbia University and the head of NATO and, and so on. I was just wondering if any thought was given to that or, uh, and specifically Columbia University and, and NATO, is there any reference to that or symbolism involved in any of the, uh, any of the items displayed here? Marco. Well, as I stated, we're working with uh, the historians and the experts. I've read everything I could find about him. And he kept referring to Abilene, so, and the barefoot boy. And we thought that was, uh, that was a moment, I think, when we talked about it, David Eisenhower burst into tears, actually, as I recall. Um, the, I think the, the, uh, we don't want to dismiss all those other things. Uh, a statue of Eisenhower may just be obvious <laughs> at this point. I don't know. We're looking into it. The hardest thing is to find a, a sculptor that uh, all the great ones are sort of gone. <laughs> um, we're getting help from a, a uh, contemporary artist, Charlie Ray, who was, uh, when I asked him to, if he would do it, he said, no, he's saving himself for MacArthur. So <laughs> that was his quick response to get himself out of it. Uh, but he said, I'll show you how to do it. So we're working on that. And uh, I don't rule out a statue of Eisenhower We've got only a few weeks to decide this, so we're pushing, uh, pushing forward. Mr. Miller. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, associate myself with uh, the remarks of Mr. Groning and others about the, the tapestry. Uh, I, I, was, I too was on site, and it is beautiful. Uh, but I also associate myself with her other remarks about the columns in particular. I think when I first saw them here, I called them the biggest, baddest bollards around. And they, they, they look, they, they are colossal, gargantuan things. Uh, if there's a way, I think the mock-up had a steel, had some kind of a steel frame, which obviously doesn't complement the architecture of the surrounding building, but I think it worked better in terms of it, it can be thinner, it can be more, it just doesn't, uh, it, 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 can, it can perform the function that you need these things to perform, I would think. Um, they just, just so, the point they're of so big. On the yeah. frame, the frame is there simply for the mock-up. Right. The, uh, there will be no frame like that on the tapestry itself. The tapestry will be the... No, I realize that. I was, oh, and I was yeah. trying to say that I kind of like that better than the 10 huge columns. Um, I mean, from the perspective I have right here, it's not so bad, but most people are going to have, a lot of people are going to have the, the other, the columns right on, right on to their, um, uh, looking at them, and, and they're just so many and so big. Yeah. Thank you. Last comments, right please. Uh, just very quickly, um, I, I just wanted to point out that the, you know, it's both the dimension of the columns diameter, but it's also height, and I really would like to see the, the other two initial proposals were at 50 and 65 feet for the initial design, so 80 feet, just, you know, what it does to the right-of-way. And I will also say, I get that the Independence Avenue is uneven, but, but I'm not wild about the, the columns intruding into the Independence Avenue right-of-way, so visibly, it's a visible intrusion is what I object to. Uh, I realized that uh, the, you know, Mr. Gary talked about the Lincoln Memorial and the Greek temple idea and the rigorous geometry of that. I, for what it's worth, I would be perfectly happy to see that relaxed um, and, to, and to be able to move things around a little bit, move those side tapestries so that um, you didn't have the rigorous geometry, but you also didn't have things intruding so that you got more space between the columns. You could have... Uh, more of that uh, monumental boulevard and not so much intrusion, um, uh, you know, when you look down the street. And what you see is not the beautiful tapestry. You see this massive, out-of-scale column. 
Uh, and one last thing, I love the idea of the outdoor room, except this is not an outdoor room. This is like an outdoor airport. Um, that that it's that it's just. I would love to to have these beautiful panels create some intimacy. Um, and 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 there are so many different parts of 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 the life of of Eisenhower. Uh, Mr. Gary spoke about the uh, the the Roosevelt Memorial, where maybe it's too many series of vignettes, but every one of those spaces is intimate and different. Um, and and I don't know. You feel like you know the man and you know the 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 woman and you know the life in a way that that I'm just not getting from this memorial, and it really has to do with scale and intimacy and, and, and what you experience at, at the ground. I think the, the changes have been in the right direction. I'd like to see more of them, and like I said, I'd like to see the, the intimate spaces for people that, that you'll be creating um, you know, on the ground of, of this memorial. Well, regarding the height, um, the 50-foot and the 65-foot columns were proposed for two other alternatives and they were enclosing different sizes of, of area and volume. So it's not necessarily r reasonable to immediately say, well, you used 60 or 65 in that. Why can't you stick it over there? It's very difficult for the client group, my commission, to um, have our design team come forward to the different review bodies in Washington and get told somewhat disparate things. And we have to work with that, and we will. There are studies that on column height that were done and we're trying to schedule meetings with NCPC staff to go over them to show how we arrived where we are and we'll be doing that in the, before we come back to you. We hope to do that in the next two weeks. And the intimacy again will be coming back with the ground plane and hopefully when you see where we are with the ground plane that you'll feel more comfortable with the scale issue. We'll see. Mr. Gary, Mr. Webb, Mr. File, thank you very much. Um, as we wrap up, uh, I want to make just a couple of points. One is a number of folks have commented about the progress that's been made. Um, I think that's been the result of a lot of collaboration. The 106 process is working, and the comments made today about columns and rights of ways and such will continue uh, in that forum, and I'm sure will be, uh, there will be consensus. Second, um, at least speaking for myself, I've seen more information today on the ground plane and some substantive details than I think I've seen before. And you just, Mr. File just mentioned that there's more information coming on that. If we could get that information so that we could look at it uh, as quickly as possible, that would be helpful. Um, and then last, I would say just regarding uh, some of these outstanding issues, I think it's important that uh, the 106 process move along fairly expeditiously so that we can then get jump immediately into the NEPA process and be ready for for December. I think that's very important. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming. It's been a very good session and I hope you've gotten some, some constructive comments back. We will have to take about a five minute break right now because this model has to be moved because it has other obligations this afternoon. And so if we can... Uh, Mr. Chairman, can yes. I interrupt for one second? I just yes. want to remind folks who have the, the interest in commenting on the, on the design, the environmental assessment um, comment period is happening right now, and so you can go to uh, our website and find the place to comment. And, Very good. And the deadline good. for that, I think, is the 19th. Thank you, Mr. May. So let's take about a five-minute... Uh, break and and uh, if we can move this model as quickly as possible that would be very helpful <laughs> we could re, re resume proceedings we'd like to call the meeting back to order Get staff back. <laughs> yes.
Can we shut the door? There. And The next item on the agenda is item number 6A. It's the first stage plan unit development and related map amendment for the Southwest Waterfront Project. And we have Mr. Hart here to kick off the discussion. Mr. Hart, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, before you today is the first stage plan unit development and related map amendment for the Southwest Waterfront in Southwest Washington, DC. Uh, this project is an important one um, because of the uh, uh, location of the Southwest Waterfront and the uh, connection that, uh, the, uh, that we want to create along the 10th Street corridor um, from the mall to the Southwest Waterfront um, as part of the Monumental Core Framework Plan um, and as uh, part of the um, uh, Southwest Eco District process that's uh, currently ongoing. Um, because of its importance, um, staff has uh, talked, uh, has consulted with the uh, developer, um, with the, uh, the, the project, and um, have uh, really focused on a couple of issues, um, those of uh, views from the uh, Banneker Overlook and um, connections uh, to and from the waterfront from the uh, Banneker Overlook. And those um, consultations have um, progressed well. Um, and I'll be presenting um, the results of, of that in this presentation. Uh, just to kind of orient uh, everyone, uh, the Southwest Waterfront um, is here. The PUD is outlined in yellow in the center of the slide. Um, the uh, 10th Street corridor is uh, highlighted here um, at, uh, and, and uh, connects to the Southwest Waterfront um, at Banneker Park and, and, and the Overlook. Um, which is, again, a, a um, prominent location. Um, also wanted to point out a couple of uh, pieces, a couple of other elements on the, uh, on the map. There's the um, several National um, Park Service properties are in the area, um, including the Banneker Park, uh, the Maine Lobsterman Park. Uh, wanted to note that Maine Lobsterman Park, um, you may notice it, it's actually this little dot that's here. It's uh, surrounded by the PUD, but it's not included in the PUD. Um, we also have the Titanic Memorial, um, and I also wanted to note that the Main Avenue Fish Market is not included in the uh, in the PUD itself, um, but wanted to note where it where it was in the uh, in the draw. Uh, previous commission action: the commission um, uh, uh, acted on a uh, street closure for Water Street, which is um, actually located. This is the yellow line that's here. It's located within the boundary of the PUD that's before you. Um, and at that time, um, using the uh, Southwest Waterfront, um, sorry, excuse me, Southwest Eco District um, discussions that have been going on, um, the two main uh, points that, that the Commission uh, recommended was to improve views and strengthen the connections. Again, strengthening, the, and, uh, strengthening connections was from Banneker um, down to the waterfront itself. And staff has actually been working with the applicant, as I said earlier, to um, to um, uh, work on those those two aspects. Now, the first stage PUD. This is the illustrative plan for the uh, for the project. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this image is uh, rotated slightly. Um, 10th Street is located here to the left of the slide, um, and as well as the uh, Banneker Park and Overlook. Um, and the north, in this case, is actually kind of diagonal on the side. So this is. Uh, north to the to the left. <coughs> um, first days PUDs really look at building massing. They they're really illustrative um, in in nature. Uh, they look at building massing. They look at the types of uses that are being proposed, um, as well as um, uh, some of the other elements um, that uh, would would go on with this particular uh, project. Um, there will be a second stage PUD that the uh, developer will um, submit for the project as well. Um, I wanted to note that the, the um, project itself is, as I said, a first stage PUD. There is um, also a zoning uh, change that's being um, uh, proposed as well. The zoning is to allow the development to uh, be under actually C3C um, and um, 
uh, R5B. Uh, these would allow um, heights of 130 feet um, and uh, 60 feet to the uh, 130 feet along Main Avenue, so these buildings, and then uh, lower, denter, lower height buildings uh, down here. The second stage PU. Yes. Sure. I'm not sure if we've asked this question before, but what I mean, noting the proximity of the buildings to the waterfront, what consideration has been given to uh, climate change and uh, presumed sea level rise over time? Uh, the developer is um, uh, actually their, their representatives are here, and I think they, they can talk about that in a little more detail um, later. This is um, uh, development um, that uh, they have uh, looked at um, sustainability as part of that. They're actually looking for lead gold for the for their project, um, and it's um, I, I believe that it's actually in a it's not on the uh, floodplain, um, so that there is, um, they um, can uh, work, they can uh, describe the uh, the project in more detail and and give you that information that you're that you're looking for. There are quite a number of tidal and coastal communities who are looking at long range plans on on buildings very close to tidal waters. So, um, this is the uh, the second and uh, first second and um, third phases actually this is a, a phase development um, they're looking at <coughs> excuse me um, uh, these uh, phases um, coming f coming forward uh, in the future the uh, second stage uh, PUD will look at um, the project in more detail and um, give uh, greater detail on um, architecture uh, building architecture um, the uh, exact uh, mix of uses um, as well as um, other site elements and just to note, this is the, uh, as you, if you didn't see, the, the main Lobsterman uh, Park that's located here. The development massing and um, <clears throat> summary, they're looking at a site area of a um, little less than a million uh, square feet. Uh, building area is 3.165 um, million gross square feet, and uh, that would lead to an, uh, an FAR of 3.19. Um, there are 2,100 to 2,600 uh, parking spaces all uh, below ground. Um, in the development as well as um, bicycle parking and bicycle storage for between 1,500 and 2,200 bicycles. Um, and finally, building heights again from 57 and uh, between 57 and 130 feet. Um, would like to note that along Main Avenue, Main Avenue is a 120 foot uh, right of way, and this would uh, allow under the Height Act um, buildings to the 130 foot um, height. <coughs> The proposed open space plan, um, I'm uh, showing this because the uh, developer has um, uh, proposed a, uh, a wharf, um, and this is, I guess, the wharf, um, and that is the main organizing factor um, for, the, uh, for the development. Um, it helps to link all of the um, streets as well as um, open spaces uh, to um, one main element. and. Um, the, if you'll note that the uh, streets, as they come um, into the development, uh, the streets are actually um, carried through and um, connect to the streets, 9th Street, uh, 7th Street, and then uh, M Street coming along here. Um, they actually uh, either end in a plaza or a park um, at each of these uh, locations. So it's really bringing the urban uh, fabric into the, uh, the, the development itself. The developer uh, has uh, submitted some uh, sketches along with the uh, the plan. Um, these are just some images of what uh, their ideas are for the uh, for the development. Looking at uh, street view along Main Avenue, um, the rooftop view uh, here, looking towards the west, um, and then two park views um, here, um, looking um, one towards East Potomac Park, and uh, another looking at the arena stage. Um, proposed, uh, proposed transportation plans, uh, we have the streetcar circulation plan as well as the bicycle amenities plan. Um, these were submitted by the uh, developer. And um, uh, for the streetcar circulation plan, there are, are uh, two 
uh, streetcar lines that are um, that will be uh, used to circulate um, into and around the uh, the development. The um, developer has not included um, uh, overhead streetcar line uh, streetcar wires as part of the uh, the images that they supplied to us, um, and uh, future. Um, elements or future uh, details will be um, worked out through the uh, second stage PUD and, and be submitted to us through the second stage PUD process. For the bicycle amenities plan, um, the uh, developer is showing that there are um, connections to the uh, uh, trails, bike trails, as well as other uh, bicycle facilities like uh, capital, sp uh, capital share, uh, bike stations, and then uh, the uh, porosity of the uh, site for bicyclists. Um, into uh, and down to the wharf. Um, staff analysis, we were really looking at um, uh, understanding the, uh, that there are current planning processes that are going on uh, with the Southwest Waterfront, uh, Southwest Eco District um, process. Uh, that was part of the uh, Monumental Core Framework Plan. And um, the main uh, issues that were really uh, discussed during the plan were that of views and also understanding the physical connection to and from uh, Banneker. Um, in addition, there's, um, uh, because of the location of uh, NPS properties, uh, there needs to be further NPS coordination as well. Um, uh, the views um, here is, uh, are two images that are showing um, a plan that um, we saw um, that staff saw back in, in November of 2010 and uh, what the current plan is showing. Um, <clears throat> in 2010, um, the, uh, uh, this is the, the 10th Street uh, overlook again, and this would be the main um, connection down to, a uh, physical connection down to the waterfront. Um, it, was, uh, it was showing a 50 to 70 foot um, kind of view shed um, down there, and uh, the issue that, that we were uh, trying to deal with was trying to widen that to allow more uh, views, or greater view to the water. Um, and the developer has actually uh, rotated buildings um, and um, re redesigned buildings to uh, allow for a wider uh, view shed. And what we have now is a 100-foot wide um, space. This is uh, actually called the uh, Market Square uh, Plaza. And this is the image that uh, the developer has, um, has submitted to us. Um, the development is uh, shown here in the left part of the, of the slide. Um, uh, Market Square uh, Plaza is here with a one-story uh, building. And um, also shown here is um, the uh, uh, Main Avenue Fish Market. Um, it's uh, uh, not part of the development, but they were just showing what that, uh, what that might look like. Now we have the block, uh, the, the uh, views looking from the, uh, this is the actually the access along uh, 10th Street. Um, and again, looking at the 2010 plan and the current plan, um, this building that was here is uh, actually sitting on, and, and all the buildings are really sitting on a uh, two to, to five story base. And uh, in this case, this building had um, two uh, residential towers that came from that that base, and um, those towers blocked the uh, the view along the um, uh, the 10th Street access. In this instance, we see that there is an 80 foot um, wide uh, view co uh, corridor now um, because of the redesign of these, uh, or actually reorientation of these buildings along that axis. Um, I would note that um, this. Um, is a section actually through this, uh, that building that you just saw. Um, again, a five floor base for the building um, would, is uh, the, the line of, uh, the, the height of which is, would be here. Um, this uh, image to the left, uh, the, the, the drawing, the section actually shows to the left the Banneker Overlook. Um, you'll note that this is actually higher. The line is higher than the, where the, the overlook is. And, um, the views uh, out from the build, from this this side would actually be um, um, really from an elevated uh, stance, and the monumental core framework plan uh, had at the end of the uh, the 10th Street terminus um, a plan for a, a memorial or, or a museum at that location. So from that there would be a, a view, but not from the actual um, 10th Street overlook. 
Um, this is just showing um, images that the developer uh, supplied um, regarding uh, uh, sections through the wharf and through um, uh, Main Avenue. Um, and uh, there, they did not include the uh, streetcar lines. Um, this is uh, just showing the connection, uh, physical connection, as part of the land uh, development agreement between the city and, excuse me, the district and the developer. Um, they are um, required to uh, develop a connection um, between the overlook and the development itself, and. Um, uh, NCPC and NPS and the uh, developer uh, will be beginning a uh, process to um, uh, design this. This is just a, um, uh, an idea of what that might look like. Um, and that process will begin to design this connection in uh, the beginning part of um, uh, 2012. Um, National Park Service coordination, um, again, because of the proximity of, um, of a, a number of National Park Service properties, um, there needs to be a further coordination um, bet uh, between the developer and the, and, and, uh, the National Park Service um, to make sure that there's um, maintaining access uh, and uh, maintaining access to these, to these sites. And with that, the executive director recommends that the commission comment favorably on the Southwest Waterfront first stage plan unit development, which identifies building massing, uh, land uses, open space development, waterfront development and improvements, as well as a related map amendment to allow it to be de developed under the C3C, W1 and, and R5B zoning districts. Notes that since the Water Street closure was approved by the commission in 2010, the District of Columbia and the developer have been working with NCPC staff on strengthening physical and visual, visual connections to the overlook with the developer committing to um, increasing the width of the Market Street, uh, Market Square to 100 feet, proposing an 80 foot wide opening between the residential towers um, and constructing a pedestrian connection from Banneker Overlook to Main Avenue. Um, and just note that overhead wires for the future st street card lines are not being proposed along this portion of Main Avenue or along the wharf and encourages the developer to meet with the National Park Service regarding strengthening connections to all of the National Park Service properties that are nearby this project. And with that, I'd. Uh, conclude our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Are there questions or comments? Mr. McGill, then Mr. Hart. Uh, a couple of questions. One, I thought from past presentations that the future of the Banneker Overlook site was up in the air, that the city would like to maybe build a garage underneath it. The commission has talked about putting a museum on top of it. And you uh, are working from an assumption that it's a grassy knoll with two stairways leading down to the ground, and then using that as a judgment for protecting view sheds and so on. What, what is the status of the future of Banneker Overlook? Well, I think that there's, um, there's been quite a bit of um, discussion, and um, I, I think that there needs to be quite a bit of more of discussion about um, what the future is. Um, I think for right now, we're looking at it as um, it currently is, and that a connection would be um, uh, really uh, some sort of stair that, that goes down to the, uh, um, to the, to the, uh, the waterfront. Um, and as part of the Southwest, water, uh, Southwest Eco District process, um, they're looking at what um, happens with uh, the, that connection and that, that terminus as well. So uh, I think there's kind of more, more planning that needs to go on before um, we get to a, this is what's going to happen, and this is the timetable for it. But so you're asking the developer to change their plan. Can I, can I speak to this? Because I think I can en enlighten on this subject a little bit. Um, I think that when the developer started out, they, they um, were looking at the, um, uh, the framework plan and, um, and other resources to try to anticipate what would happen in the future in, in Banneker planning for the future. Um, and uh, I, I think... They, um, as a result, there were certain assumptions about uh, the density of what would happen there. And I think, frankly, the, 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 the uh, assumption about density uh, overestimated what the density would be. Um, you know, the Park Service, which controls the site completely, um, anticipates that it would eventually be used for a museum or a memorial site or some combination thereof. And it may include a parking garage for buses and, uh, or whatever. Uh, purpose, um, but um, we we did not anticipate that the building would be built out to the full 
FAR of a office type development, and I think that's kind of what was pictured initially. I mean, so, so the building down below. No, no, no. That the banneker would be oh. built out. You know, you just take a right. you know the maximum footprint and extrude it up to the maximum height, and that's and then you have very narrowly defined view quarters. Um, we didn't see that happening in the future at any point. Um, we always thought that if it was going to be a significant build out with a museum, that it would still be a uh, an object in a landscape as opposed to a, uh, a downtown ah, office okay. building kind of setting. Okay. So there's still going to be, we think, in the future, some uh, outdoor amenity associated with that overlooked site, whether it's associated with a memorial or museum, or even if it is associated with other development, there's going to be some place there, uh, and there's going to need to be a connection to it. Now, how do you design based on that? I mean, it's it's not enough to, to, to form things, uh, I think, too specifically the way they have tried to adapt the design to the arena stage. Um, and, and shape the plaza that's opposite the arena stage. Here, it's a, uh, it's a lot more speculative, um, but I think that they have uh, stepped up and tried to pick what um, were the important view corridors and, and put some focus on those okay. so that there are these visual connections from Banneker Overlook to East Potomac Park and the water beyond. So okay. it's 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 a it's a been a difficult balance, but I think that they've moved in the right direction. Um, and plus, we don't know when anything is going to happen there. It could be, right. you know, twenty or thirty years in the future. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to just ignore it. Okay. So so then, then and carrying this a little further, um, marching down the development, you've got other view sheds that are potentially valuable and important and and pre are preceding this development. So you've got the arena stage with this spectacular new addition and balconies overlooking the water. And then you've got all those thousands of condominium units in the Southwest Redevelopment Area. Now, I thought I heard somewhere that there were gonna be medium rise buildings built on piers sticking out into the water that would block the views of most of those residences in the Southwest Redevelopment Area. And so I'm just curious, has the staff looked at other view sheds worthy of being protected uh, or respected? Can I jump in? I mean, the, I have a harsh answer, Mike, but I, I, won't, I won't use that answer. Um, the, the developer has been, and the architects have been very uh, thoughtful, I think, about designing taller, narrower buildings so that you know, the things that, that we really want to protect as a commission is more the public spaces and the public views and the public rights of way. So we have a termination at the end of every street that now can come down to the waterfront, um, you know, out a pier into a plaza with views of the water. Um, you know, basically this land, um, you know, there's not a property right that private property holders have to be able to look at views, you know, on the site or, you know, we, I think the, the, the team did a great job accommodating arena stage, but arena stage actually could have been on the water. And that was one suggestion. Then there wouldn't be an issue about protecting views of the water, but in deciding to be in a different location, you don't get to build your property somewhere else and get, and get the views you didn't buy. Right. So that's maybe a little harsher than I meant to be, but, but yes. But the public spaces is what we're kind of concerned about as a commission. I think they've done a really great job protecting that, and I and I think the point that uh, um, that that Peter made, which is it is speculative, although I think we all agree that because of the Southwest Waterfront development, you know, we've tried to shop that Banneker site around, you know, to you know, uh, let me put it that way, offered it as a potential uh, commemoration site, maybe an alternative to the mall. Um, in many, on many occasions, and it wasn't appealing, but I think that the very fact of the Southwest Waterfront development is going to really rehabilitate this corridor and make it much more likely that, the, that there will be a commemorative site there. What we've asked the developer to do is to provide a meaningful connection from Banneker to the Southwest Waterfront so that people aren't taking a goat path down that hill. And, and poor tourists who get to the end of what looks like a boulevard are you know stunned and appalled that uh, it's just a wasteland? So, 
Uh, that may not be the ultimate permanent connection, but it might last for decades, as, as Peter suggested. And in the meantime, we're trying to figure out other ways uh, in, in which we can, you know, uh, look at parking, look at other things that would accommodate the needs of the Park Service in the city, um, and, and yet, you know, allow these other important uses to be there. The, we don't know what the future um, building or buildings or space use will be there, but the fact that there are two very prominent view corridors preserved suggests that any talented architect could work with that uh, in an orientation of a new uh, building or monument or memorial and, uh, and, and do very well. Can I, can I just say that, that there are some issues with views from certain private properties? Um, I don't think they're specific to the, to the development that's on the pier itself, um, but by no means do they obstruct the views of most of the, the uh, homeowners in that area. I mean, if you just look at it on the plan, you can see it, it, it does not affect the vast majority of the, of the condominiums and townhomes in that area. So. Mr. Hart. Um, a question on the, uh, the wharf area. I, I believe that what I'm seeing is that it's a public right of way for vehicles and pedestrians. Um, but is it really a dedicated street or is it still private development as is it will it be given to the uh, the district right at any point um, it's my understanding that they are uh, that it will be a private street um, but it will be a um, public right-of-way so that um, if you want to so bike a, on it you can walk on it yes yeah. I, I like the fact that we're, we're allowing people to get up right against the water and have that opportunity to interact and I appreciate the, the fact that the design is advanced. Uh, it's taken into account a lot of the sensitivities that were voiced at this commission at the last time uh, we looked at this, and I have no hesitation in supporting this. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, uh, let's start with a compliment. Uh, it looks like, uh, per an article in the Examiner, that there was recently an award to the Car Hospitality and Intercontinental Hotel Groups for a 260-room hotel as part of this $2 billion redevelopment, so congratulations on that. It's nice to go with a local firm. Um, is this the hotel that, according to the layout, is in Parcel 5 that's indicated as uh, number the, one, kind the, of the square structure. The, the car hotel is on parcel three. Three. Let me, get, let me get down to it. Back. Sorry, it's. No, she had a couple there. Oh, there actually, this is maybe. Wait, this. The, the hotel I was You'll need to you, use the. You, you, need the, you need the mic. You need to use the microphone, and please. So you're uh, looking at this. Note oh, your name for the record, please. Yes, uh, Matthew Stainhook with P. N. Hoffman. Okay. The car hotel is in parcel three. It's a luxury hotel product. Mm -hmm. And in parcel five is two hotels that are controlled by the JVG companies, a limited service and an extended stay hotel. Okay, gotcha. Um, on the, uh, and the other congratulations was uh, green space, 56% by my calculation. 15 acres out of 26.6, .6, so 56% green spaces, which is highly commendable. On the uh, view sheds from Banneker, both the primary view sheds as well as reciprocal from East Potomac Park and the uh, Washington uh, Channel, um, good uh, good progress, I think. Um, applaud you on the 30 to 50 feet that was given with the market square. Want to continue to press that if we could. Uh, please, if you would, consider widening Theater Alley. Please, if you would, consider uh, shaving off that residential tower on the structure adjacent to Theater Alley. For example, could you go to that uh, that slide that shows the, the north end of the development? Yeah, let me get my set of pointer here someplace. Um, the little the little wedge shape at the, yes, right, right there. For example, if that was either shaved off and rotated along the north side, the L-shaped nor, nor, uh, north uh, e extension, you could easily widen the uh, the view shed from the Banneker overlook, particularly the elevated view shed, if you just uh, shaved that off and relocated it to the north side of that. And then you wouldn't uh, have to. You said you. Exactly. Just shave it off there and put it in the existing view shed. Let me see if I can show you what I'm talking about. Here. Take, 
take it from there to here, and then you would have a view shed like this, along yeah. along oh. Theater Alley, along the axis of Theater Alley. Just put it right there, as opposed to right there. Part of it is it blocks clearly the view if you're in this northern uh, um, residential space, condos, or whatever this apartment is. It's you. You don't have a view, so the 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 value and the price of property property value in real estate diminishes because it's blocked by this. But if it's rotated right here, and then you have a view shed like so, just for your consideration. But this is clearly good progress from last. Joint uh, planning, I think that was mentioned with the Southeast Echo District uh, planning folks. Um, there's some language in here. It, at this point, it, the language is encourages developer to work with the Park Service on strengthening connections. I would defer to my Park Center Commissioner and colleague if that language is strong enough as opposed to requires the developer. I, I don't even I don't even know that it's necessary, it's frankly. Un, I mean, unfavorable transitions to the Park Service properties. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any interest in expecting it. I, I don't even know that it's necessary. I mean, I think that the, the dialogue has been constructive so far, and the developer seems quite amenable to doing many of the things that we'd like to see done, we, so I'm not... We also I'm, met with the, some of your colleagues just yesterday to talk about all these issues. So it's, Exactly. It's I, don't, yeah, I don't know exactly what's happening because of my involvement in the PUD case, but uh, I know that it is happening, so I'm confident there. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Goni. I'll just say... Um, you know, this is a great project, important to the city, and I very much appreciate how much the design team um, and the developer have worked with the commission and the various members of the commission to accommodate the concerns that have been raised. And I hope that all of you will join me um, if I were to move the EDR. Ms. Young? Oh, we, we do have uh, public oh, comment. Certainly. Um, Mr. Steenhook, we have one speaker, uh, Mr. Steenhook. Um, <laughs> if you want to take three minutes, you have three okay, minutes. I believe. Uh, thank you, Commission, for your time. Thank okay. you for your questions. We've uh, enjoyed working with the staff of the National Capital Planning Commission, Commission of Fine Arts, Office of Planning, National Parks, the whole group. And I look forward to contributing to that conversation going forward, and I think our plan has been has been greatly enriched by their contributions over the last 2007 or so. So, Terrific. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you again. Indeed. Uh, there is a motion on the table, and it has been moved to approve the EDR. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Agenda item number 5B is an information presentation beyond granite forms of remembrance and celebration competition Ms. Kempf is here Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Today I plan to update you on a project in partnership with GSA, its Office of Planning and Design Quality. <clears throat> it includes a design competition and temporary installation in the Federal Triangle. We'd like to thank Mina Wright, Mike McGill, and others at GSA for their support. <clears throat> and today we welcome Christine Ewing, the Regional fin Fine Arts Officer at GSA NCR. She'll be sharing the presentation with me. Although Washington may be most well known for its permanent memorials, this project is a pilot designed to explore <coughs> commemorative forms through temporary display. The permanent memorial is a powerful art form, and appropriately in Washington it comes with boundaries regarding content and a specific process for site and design. But there are a number of ways, including permanent display, for the public to celebrate and reflect on contemporary issues of importance to them. 
As we'll explore in the presentation, temporary display may offer opportunity where the permanent by design does not. Together, they can both enrich Washington's public realm in response to public history and memory through art. Through a competition, our goal is to support a broad public dialogue about diverse forms of remembrance and celebration, to generate innovative submissions that would enrich Washington's cultural and commemorative landscapes, and diversify the palette of materials that we commonly associate with memorialization. Additional goals include to activate a public space that's perhaps overlooked today, and to help the public and, and sponsors visualize in a very dynamic way design opportunities on a site in the Federal Triangle and off of the National Mall. So how did we get here? The framework plan identifies sites and areas that can support activities such as celebration, commemoration, and other cultural uses. And we really see this current competition at the intersection of placemaking and those vital activities. The plan called for a range of opportunities, including temporary display, as a way of meeting those needs and enlivening the public realm. Our commemoration study found that cities in the U.S. and abroad have successfully developed projects that support temporary display in addition to permanent memorialization as a means of celebrating a community's history, important people, and other events. And we'll see some examples of those projects in the presentation today. In 2010, NCPC co-sponsored several events that began to specifically look at opportunities for temporary display in our nation's capital. And earlier this year at its retreat, commissioners supported developing a pilot project in Washington of temporary installations. So since the retreat, NCPC staff has been working with GSA to develop a project plan. And just in terms of the broad strokes, NCPC supporting um, is uh, doing planning support, whereas GSA will administer the project over the next several years. So we're here to brief you today on our progress, get your feedback on our approach and our goals, and, um, but before digging in uh, to the specifics of the project plan, we're proposing temporary display. So what exactly does that mean? We have a long tradition in the United States of using temporary exhibits in the fields of architecture, urban planning, design, and art as a way of sparking innovative ideas and exploring new concepts. Whether experienced as a larger than life and awe-inspiring gesture, or something more intimate and built to a personal scale, the temporary can be transformative. The ghost bike, for example, is a simple roadside memorial in a place where a cyclist has been killed, but it's also become a universal symbol today of passing motorists to share the road. Tribute and Light is perhaps one of our most famous and well-recognized memorials today, and it's temporary in the sense that it's event-based. We've taken important strides in building a permanent memorial and museum in remembrance of September 11th, but in the meantime, this memorial was in place within months and provided immediately a stunning symbol of remembrance. Today, GSA and NCPC are developing a competition that more formally explores this tradition of using temporary exhibits as a medium that can respond to ideas about remembrance and celebration, which is such an important concept in our nation's capital. As I've already mentioned, NCPC and its partners have met this desire on a site level with the Memorials and Museums Master Plan and the Monumental Core Framework Plan. And with this current pro partnership with GSA, we explore form in addition to site. Whoops. We took an important step in defining what a competition might look like at the 2010 Beyond Granite Forum, where we heard from experts in the U.S. and abroad about specific projects and programs that have worked in their communities. From the creator of Tribute and Light, for example, we, we sort of uh, gained a technical understanding of what it actually meant to put together a project like this and pay for it in such a short amount of time, six months. We also heard from the director of London's Fourth Plinth, a program in one of London's most prominent uh, monumental and symbolic settings. The, prov the plinth provides for temporary display on a 150-year-old plinth that until recently sat empty because no one could agree on what memorial should uh, belong there, and so they just basically didn't put anything there. And so here are some examples of pieces that have been on display there for about a year or so. On the upper left is Ship in a Bottle, which commemorates specifically the Battle of Trafalgar, although in a, in a bit of an unusual way. And this project really enables us to learn about a process that they used in London 
to select and pay for these works. According to Ms. Simons, who's the director, through contrast, these works have really embellished the permanent settings um, at Trafalgar Square. For us, one of the most inspirational aspects of this project is the level of outreach that they have incorporated into this project. There is a public vote at the semifinalist stage, so they have six finalists, and the public actually gets to weigh in and say, what pieces that they would like to see. And then also there's a parallel student competition, so you have people of all ages weighing in on content, which I think is pretty um, inspirational, and we'd like to incorporate at least a level of this type of outreach in our project plan. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Christine Ewing to go over the project plan. Thank you, Lucy, and good afternoon. We took some of the key lessons from the forum and the workshop in developing our project plan. One of the first steps we took was understanding the opportunities associated with temporary display. In addition to the examples we've already shown, the following slides include project types we've explored for the competition. Recently, Washington, D.C. added a road tattoo to its commemorative landscape that will vanish over time. Created by the sons and daughters of soldiers serving in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the participants helped to create a work of art that is both a commemorative work and an experience. Fully integrated into the cityscape, the piece blurs the line between sacred and public space. This aerial piece was installed for a month to commemorate the Biennial of the Americas. It incorporates fabrics that move with the wind and change color with the time of day. Here we have the architectural pavilion in Millennium Park, which was installed for five months period in celebration of the Burnham Plan Centennial. One of the most interesting aspects of this project is in the interior. It featured a film installation projected onto the fabric interior. The film reflects Chicago's transformation from 1909 to the present and included voices of people throughout the region sharing their visions of the future. This is an adaptable work, so theoretically, an architectural pavilion like this could become a place that houses a number of different types of perspectives through different multimedia applications. Finally, some have considered the National Memorial AIDS quilt as both an event and a memorial. Half a million people visited the quilt while on display on the mall, and over 20 years later, many still remember it. What do all these diverse projects have in common? Well, they're all event-based, up for a limited period of time, with shortened display times also comes shorter production times. Because of that, there's an opportunity for more immediacy and responsiveness to whatever issue the work explores. Many works have innovative materials. Several explore the intersection of sacred and public space. And the public may be invited to help create the work. Without the built interpretive features like permanent signage, viewers have a different experience with the installation and the space. Finally, temporary display supports adaptable open spaces for current and future use. The space we propose for the display is the mid block of 12th and Pennsylvania in Northwest. We selected this site because it is embraced by historic monumental federal buildings and located in the Federal Triangle across from the old post office. We see many opportunities to improve public engagement and activity in this space. Sometimes called the Hemicycle or the Aerial Rios Plaza, there are many reasons for selecting the site. It is under the jurisdiction of GSA and in the boundaries of the Federal Triangle Precinct Security Plan. The Memorials and Museums Master Plan identifies it as a future location for commemorative work, so we are pleased to sponsor this project for the public to visualize the opportunities at such an interesting location off the National Mall. Let's walk through some of the key activities associated with each of these major steps, starting with where we're at today in the pre-competition planning. We are working with a competition advisor called Land Air out of New York. Land Air managed the 9-11 Memorial Competition, and they participated in a number of cultural and parks projects, such as Battery Park Revitalization, and we're very excited to work with an organization that brings such expertise to our project. 
As part of the development of the competition brief, we asked the advisor to look at the project topologies that we've identified in this presentation and to make recommendations regarding the strengths and opportunities of each approach in terms of the site and in consideration of our goals. Going back to the project plan, in terms of the competition, the framework for our partnership uses existing GSA programs that support both civic art and the development of the public, public realm in our nation's capital, including its form, function, and interface with federal buildings. We are drawing upon our design excellence program to assist with the procurement process and the competition. We also have a strong art and architecture program where we contract with artists for public art across the nation. And our first impressions program recognizes the importance of the visitor's experience in our public spaces and plazas, like the hemicycle. So in conclusion, we believe that there are so many interesting opportunities at this important site in Washington, and we look forward to working with the National Capital Commission on this project because both of our agencies share a strong interest in exploring the intersection of placemaking, public engagement, artistic forms of remembrance and celebration in our nation's capital. So we welcome your questions, and thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a very important uh, initiative that we've been talking about for some time. Is the NEA involved uh, in this at all? I don't think so. Today. Questions or comments? Mr. Goni? I think it's a great project and I and I strongly support it. I've said this to uh, uh, to to staff. My only uh, small comment or concern is that it's a, in a bit of an out of the way location and that I think that the benefit of the demonstration that you're trying to to make um, you know, you may not get the, have the same impact as, as if it was maybe directly on Pennsylvania Avenue or, or somewhere else. But um, I, I do applaud the effort. Mr. Provencia. Could we get copies of your materials so that we could perhaps on an agency level adapt and adopt a similar program mm, in sure. areas that would lend themselves to exhibiting? This particular area, it's uh, very limited as far as putting a something like a fourth plinth pedestal upon which to display would, because uh, a lot of it is green, is this, uh, two, two questions, would it be paved so that crowds could gather okay. around and observe the, the artwork? Yeah, but one of the things that we've asked the excuse me, one of the things that we've asked the competition advisor to do is to prepare recommendations regarding the type of infrastructure that we, we might need mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm whatever the installation will be. So at this point, we're, we're trying to keep as open a mind as mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. to the number of possibilities. Second question, is this a primary ac uh, entrance, access and egress to this building that would need to be respected and preserved mm -hmm. and not encroached on in any way? I don't, I don't think so, but we're working with the asset manager and we'll, we'll make sure we we'll find okay. out. Okay. But thank you. Also, do you make road trips? Would you come out to our agency and talk about this if we were to invite you? Mm -hmm. we would love to. We'll okay. right. bring the presentation out. And <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. McGill. Uh, I think this is a really intriguing proposal. Uh, we, at one point, were looking at redoing this plaza in front of the ellipse and moving the Benjamin Franklin statue there from the corner of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue <laughs> until we discovered the city owned the Benjamin Franklin statue. <laughs> 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 but we were going to kind of redo the plaza. And <laughs> <laughs> And incorporate some security measures. Uh, it is it is an entrance uh, for EPA. It's an access route for Wilson Plaza, and it also has over on the left side of the area it has a metro station, uh, elevator uh, bank for the metro station. Um, but that simply means that there would be hopefully more people going back and forth by whatever exhibits are proposed. Uh, it also I think. Uh, would help further our efforts to make the Federal Triangle more porous and create more connections between the mall and downtown by getting people to leave the mall and look at these temporary installations. And finally, I think it, it helps. Uh, I mean, Kirk Savage made a very eloquent case for this in his book. And one thing that strikes me is that uh, in reading about monuments and memorials, there's a tension between meeting the needs of the immediate people impacted by whatever event is being commemorated and finding a timeless design. Um, Maya Angelou did a fantastic job with that at the Vietnam Memorial, 
but I fear that the World War II Memorial is more uh, responsive to the wishes and desires of the survivors than to necessarily being a timeless design. And having a, a series of temporary memorials along this line, if we can cre create a momentum to, to do this on an ongoing basis, would be one way of testing out designs for possible future memorials. And I think that would be very effective and useful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Terrific. Agenda item 5C is the next to the last. It's an information presentation, <clears throat> and it's on the Navy installation master plan. It's an update, and Mr. Detman is back. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, very quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, the Navy's here to provide you with a short brief on its efforts to uh, update uh, several installation master plans located throughout the region. Um, you'll recall that uh, the Commission has recently had some discussions related to uh, DOD, some Navy projects in regarding um, the lack of an updated master plan. Uh, what you'll see today is a, is a product of some of the discussions that NCPC staff and DOD staff have been involved in, some of the very positive discussions in making inroads in terms of putting together a master plan structure that meets both the Navy's and NCPC staff's needs. And so uh, I want to hand it over to uh, Mr. Kevin Montgomery. He's with uh, NAFAC Washington to provide you with a brief. Mr. Montgomery, welcome back. Hello. Do you, have, do you have any materials that we could follow along with? Uh, I did not, did not make any make handouts. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Montgomery. I'm here representing the Naval Facilities Engineering Command Washington. Uh, the purpose of the brief today is to inform you on our efforts to update installation master plans within the National Capital Region. Uh, We're looking to inform the Commission and solicit feedback on the Navy's eff efforts to update installation master plans within the NCR, including the proposed framework for the master plans, transportation management plans, and NEPA documentation associated with those master plans. NAFAC Washington is currently preparing installation master plans for six Department of Navy installations within the National Capital Region. Those installations are the Washington Navy Yard, Naval Support, Support Facility Arlington, Naval Support Facility Naval Observatory, Naval Support Facility Carter Rock, the Naval Research Lab <coughs> at Washington, and Joint Base Anacostia Anna Bowling. In, in extensive consultation with NCPC staff and including two DOD uh, level meetings with staff and commission members, NAVFAC Washington has identified the following path forward to prepare updated installation ma management plans for these six installations and meet the NEPA requirement associated with master plan review by the commission. The IMPs will be composed of a short term and a long term development plan. The short term component of the master plans will be based off the Department of Defense's military construction budget process. Each DOD department and agency develops a program objective memorandum known as a palm. The palm covers a budget year and four out years. Mil MILCON projects require congressional approval and the money is obligated for up to five years. The short term development plans will cover a five year horizon of known development projects which aligns the Navy's five-year development and funding process for construction. The long-term component of the master plans will be comprised of a series of components, including uh, overlay maps uh, consisting of transportation and circulation uh, ways forward, um, ideas in terms of long-term um, additions to our open space and conservation areas, it will also look at our parking inventory, things such as our landscaping plan and our stormwater management plan. Com components will provide the commission context for long-term installation planning. Each one of these master plan updates will have a NEPA component, uh, an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement, and the appro appropriate 
decision document will be prepared for each installation master plan. The EA or EIS will provide a detailed analysis of the short-term development plan. The EA or EIS will also analyze the cumulative impacts of the short and long-term development plans in conjunction, conjunction with past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future development around the installation. Emergent projects will continue to be analyzed under NEPA on a project-specific basis. The Navy will reevaluate the status of each IMP at the conclusion of the short-term five-year planning horizon. For purposes of this brief, we're going to use the Washington Navy Yard Master Plan to show data collection methods and analysis we plan to do for each installation master plan update. While mission focused, the Department of the Navy strives to develop spaces that enable a high quality of life within the urban setting of Washington, D.C. The, Depart the Department of the Navy is unique as many of our installations have multiple tenants. NAVFAC, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, serves as the landlord to these tenants. This slide's showing uh, the various command, naval commands at the Washington Navy Yard. Um, the figure next to it also lays out a uh, percentage of land use for each, uh, for each area on the Navy Yard, the largest being administrative. Um, we'll go into more detail in future slides. Um, anticipated growth at the Washington Navy Yard over the next five years is based on internal tenant growth and no new facilities. As you can see, uh, over the next five years, we only anticipate an additional 375 employees being added to the Navy Yard. Um, no major uh, military construction. Most will be as a result of renovation of existing space. There is some demoli demolition associated with work being done at the Navy Yard over the next five years. Uh, there will be, there is no plans to increase parking at the Washington Navy Yard over the next five years. This slide is showing uh, existing land use categories and how the Navy foresees the long-term land use being uh, uh, facilitated at the Navy Yard. Uh, we tried to incorporate a legend on this slide, but it got too small to really gather what it was saying. Um, but what I can point out is that the blue area on the existing uh, slide or figure is administrative and the long-term blue is also administrative. The brown on the existing, uh, the far right-hand corner is an example that shows parking and then our long-term outlook shows that potentially that space would be um, moved to administrative functions. We collected survey data that allows us to analyze commuting patterns and better understand where employees live. This particular slide is showing employees by zip code. Um, it's showing the major metro lines of transportation. It's also showing the major roadways coming in and out of the city. Uh, the different colors represent uh, number of employees based off survey results. Uh, the white area is showing that zero employees as far as our survey is considered or commuting to the Washington Navy Yard. Uh, the, the, brown, the light brownish color is one to 10 employees. The green is 10 to 25 employees. And then the darker brown areas are showing 20, potentially 26 to 94 employees. No, this is, uh, we conducted a survey and got results based on where people were commuting from. This doesn't address commuting modes. This slide is showing commuting, uh, commuting habits of Washington Navy Yard employees. Uh, it's showing total commuters by distance traveled. We found that our largest number of commuters are coming from 10 to 20 miles away. It's also showing here that we have a large number of dedicated drivers coming in to the Navy Yard.
when we, synth when we synth synthesize the last two graphs, we see that the 10 to 20 mile range commuters are the majority of our dedicated drivers. This type of information allows us to target programs on our TMP that will have the greatest impact to our transportation issues. The Navy is committed to implementing innovative transportation demand management policies through the TMP to reduce SOV trips to the Washington Navy Yard. The Navy is currently refining and redevelop redeveloping the following TDM measures. Um, we're on board to hire a regional employee transportation coordinator. We're taking measures to reduce SOV trips to the Washington Navy Yard. And we're also heavily uh, promoting variable work schedules. The Navy will evaluate the TMP every two years and update it every five. The Navy looks to continue its close coordination with NCPC staff throughout the master planning process for the six Department of Navy installations. Uh, we've listed out here um, the agencies and offices we also uh, intend to include as we move forward with these master plan updates. Uh, next step, uh, we're currently planning on submitting the Was draft Washington Navy Yard master plan in the December-January time frame. Um, and continue our work with NCPC staff to get to a final approved master plan. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Uh, I've got Mr. several Montgomery. questions, um, partly to you and partly to staff. Um, as I recall, the Washington Navy Yard has more parking than the NCPC ratios would call for. Is that correct? That's correct. And you said the Navy Yard isn't planning on increasing its parking. No, sir. But you didn't say they're planning on decreasing the parking. That is correct. What we're hoping to do is through the different mitigation me measures we're hoping to implement, we can get closer to that ratio. But right now, um, nothing's going to happen overnight. I mean, we, this is a problem that we're trying to address long term. And we're hoping that after the five years is up and we're required to update this master plan again, we can show that the measures we've taken have made a significant uh, increase in, in getting us closer to the required ratio. Well, I, but in, like in the long term, you, you showed an area in the lower right-hand corner that was brown in the existing but was blue in the, in the proposed. So that looks like you are thinking about eliminating parking. It's potentially an option, but I don't definitively know if that is going to happen as of right now. Okay. Now, second question, uh, more I think more for the staff. I'm curious why you would agree on a Navy Yard master plan being the highest priority for submission when they're only proposing to increase their staff by 300 people over the next five, ten years versus other facilities like Anacostia Bowling where much more ambitious plans are in place and therefore more important decisions are going to come before the commission that should be contrasted against a master plan. I don't think today's presentation is intended to um, give the commission an idea of when the particular installation master plans are going to be submitted. There was really, the, the Navy Yard was simply uh, presented to you as kind of an example of what the overall structure of the master plan will be. It's going to be a short term based on a five year window that's tied to the military's budget uh, process. Um, and then the long term, it's going to take a long term look at what the particular in agency wants to do with the installation long term in terms of transportation, land use, etc. Um, I think that uh, your point about the Navy Yard having small growth and, and JBAB potentially seeing big growth is a very good point. Uh, we can talk to the Navy going forward about which ones we think should be coming in sooner rather than later. Also point out the um bowling uh, master plan was actually brought before the commission a few months ago so that's um, that was um, something that was on the dock and also the commission over time has taken a uh, position regarding the Navy yards in terms of completing the master plan before they see future projects so um, that's been in writing for many years so uh, I think the Navy understands the urgency of getting both done uh, but I think they they're working through this process and I believe that this presentation is to show you that Questions? Mr. Mr. Um, 
at some point, um, I think it would be helpful to know uh, sort of what are the values or the objectives of the plan that um, of the planning process that the Navy proposes to undertake. So um, the commission has a sense of what it is you're trying to get to. Um, you know what what changes you're trying to make. Uh, environmental sustainability, stormwater, employee satisfaction, retention, whatever it might be so that, um, you know, we get a bigger picture idea of what you're trying to accomplish by virtue of your planning process. Yes, ma'am. We, we have that information and we plan to incorporate it into the master plan. So you will see that at the time we submit the draft. I want to commend the Navy for the presentation. It's always helpful to have these informational uh, presentations. And, and as you stated up front, the objective was to talk about the process as opposed to the objectives of the plan, uh, which are established in NCPC uh, supplemental uh, guidance. I noted, too, with interest that the scope of uh, per the slide number five uh, meets and exceeds a couple of the NCPC requirements for master planning. So I commend you also uh, on that effort as well as taking to heart some of the previous feedback that we have provided here at commission <coughs> meetings as well as uh, DOD level meetings. So, thank you. Headed, headed in the right direction at the right speed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery, very much. And thank you, Mr. Provencia, for your continued assistance on so many of these DOD-related matters. Agenda item number 5D is our last uh, information presentation and it's on the Federal Triangle Stormwater Study. We have Ms. Tars here. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the Commission. My presentation today will highlight the findings of the Federal Triangle Stormwater Drainage Study which was conducted by the consulting firms of Greeley and Hansen and Limnotech. Tech. In addition to Greeley and Hansen's report, the working group prepared a companion report that documents the context of the multi-agency efforts to address flooding in the monumental core, clarifies how the study adds to our existing knowledge about the June 2006 flood, and describes in greater detail how the working group contributed to the development of the study. Yeah. We plan to release the Federal Triangle Stormwater Drainage Study and the companion report to the public in the next few days, and they will be downloadable from our NCPC website. As many of you know, the Washington, D.C. region experienced record rainfall the week of June 25, 2006, which caused extensive flooding that crippled the transportation, commerce, and business operations in the region. In the Monumental Corps, several federal headquarter buildings in the Federal Triangle and the Smithsonian Museums flooded, causing millions in damages, threatening the security of federal operations and preservation of our national treasures. Since the 2006 flood, federal and district agencies have committed time and resources to address the flooding issues in the Monumental Corps, including several flooding studies. In June 2007, NCPC convened the Multi-Agency Flood Forum, which recommended policies to address flooding in the Monumental Core. The Federal Triangle Stormwater Drainage Study is one of many recommendations from that flood forum. In October 2008, DCOP, DDOE, FEMA, GSA, the Smithsonian, and DC Water committed to fund the study. Another eight agencies completed the working group. NCPC staff managed the project for the working group. My presentation has five parts. I'll outline the scope of the study, present the existing conditions, and highlight the findings. Then I will briefly discuss the important considerations that decision makers will need to address and the working group's next steps. Our study area includes the buildings in the Federal Triangle, the National Gallery of Art, and the Smithsonian Museums immediately south of Constitution Avenue in the National Mall. The study analyzed how the sewer system performed during the 2006 flood 
using a flood model that combines surface runoff and the existing sewer system. Through the flood modeling, the consultants were able to determine the ponding levels for various storms. More importantly, this study evaluated and analyzed the viability of six stormwater management alternatives, highlighted in orange on the right column, and the effectiveness of an early warning system. This study only focused on area-wide solutions and did not evaluate site-by-site -site solutions such as floodproofing of buildings. So what do we know today about the sewer system that serves the Federal Triangle? The Federal Triangle is served by the combined sewer system. During periods of heavy rainfall, the capacity of the combined sewer may be exceeded and the excess flow which is a mixture of stormwater and sanitary wastewater, is discharged directly to the Anacostia River. Two sewer lines serve the Federal Triangle. Both lines run along Constitution Avenue, but in opposite direction, and are designed to handle no more than a 15-year storm event. The Federal Triangle is the lowest point of a drainage basin that's 24 times its size. When it rains, stormwater from higher ground within this large drainage basin, outlined in purple on the map, flows down to the Federal Triangle through the sewer pipes and on-street surfaces. So what happened during the 2006 flood? We learned that most of the rain fell between 9 p.m. on June 25th and 1 a.m. the next day. The amount of rain that fell exceeded a 200-year storm event. So if you think about it, the sewer system can only handle a 15-year storm and we got a 200-year storm. So even though we found that the sewer system and the pumping stations were all working, it was not sized to handle such a big storm. The Potomac River was not at flood stage and did not contribute to the 2006 flood. And the 17th Street Levee Closure Project, which is under construction, protects the monumental core from river flooding but not from interior drainage flooding. So, so to address the interior drainage flooding, the working group and the consultants identified six structural alternatives and found that three are viable solutions for mitigating flooding due to a 50 year, 100 year, and 200 year storm return frequencies. The working group selected the 100-year design flood since this is the basis for FEMA's flood insurance program. To account for climate change in the form of more frequent severe storms, we also looked at the 200-year storm event. The first two alternatives, which considered low-impact development strategies, such as bioswales and green roofs to capture stormwater, cannot mitigate flooding if they are employed as standalone solutions but they can contribute to improving water quality in the watershed and reducing the amount of storm water discharged into the combined sewer system. So the first viable alternative involves constructing storage tanks under the mall to collect excess water from the Federal Triangle and reusing that water to irrigate the landscaping at the mall. We looked at a range of storage capacities under the mall and found that these storage tanks are significantly larger than what NPS is currently constructing for their own use. <coughs> the second alternative is a very straightforward solution. It's adding a pumping station that will draw water out of the Federal Triangle and um, discharge it into the tidal basin. The third alternative, also a very straightforward engineering solution, is um, the construction of a 14-foot diameter or a 20-foot diameter sewer um, pipe that will connect to the Owen Main Street pumping station um, near the National Stadium. For this study, the working group did not recommend a specific alternative at this time because they realized that there are other important considerations before the best alternative can be identified. As the table shows, the system-wide solution posed significant costs. We also know that large-scale projects, such as the structural alternatives, for a 100-year and 200-year flood involve lengthy time periods for implementation and complex political and procedural requirements that could determine their practicality. The fact that flooding can happen in any given year in the Federal Triangle Study Area 
makes short-term solutions attractive, but these solutions, such as site-by-site -site flood protection, do not solve the flooding problem. The working group also contemplated the viability of a hybrid solution as a less expensive way of mitigating for flooding, using a combination of smaller and less costly alternatives to buy down the flood risk. For instance, we could collect the first one and one and a half inch of rain through low impact developments such as bioswales and green roofs, and then capture the stormwater in underground storage tanks, perhaps in the National Mall, and then using the existing sewer to discharge the remaining stormwater. And with the residual risk of flood, we can um, protect our buildings by flood proofing them. There are also ancillary benefits for some of the alternatives that are beyond the scope of the consultant's work to determine. Low impact development strategies, although they may not mitigate flooding, have environmental and social benefits beyond reducing the stormwater that the sewer system has to handle. Multi-purpose solutions such as using perimeter security walls as flood barriers for buildings could provide the best return on public investments. The working group recently used the predicted funding levels for Constitution Avenue from this study to protect their buildings from potential flooding due to Hurricanes Irene and Lee. Most of the buildings have some level of protection already, but with the new data and more accurate models for the Federal Triangle, triangle Drainage Area, they were better prepared to protect their building from severe storm events and they have a better understanding of the vulnerability of their facilities from future flooding. WAMADA is also using the ponding elevation data to design protections for their vent shafts in the Federal Triangle. With the understanding of the limitations of the existing sewer system, the high capital cost required for a system-wide solution, and the need for short-term mitigation, the working group decided to further evaluate their facility's vulnerability to flooding and determine whether they need additional flood protection for their buildings. On October 31, 2011, NCPC, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and FEMA will be hosting a flood-proofing seminar to offer training that explains how Executive Order 11988 applies to existing federal buildings in the floodplain, such as the case in the Federal Triangle. The Corps and FEMA will also provide tools to help the working group conduct a vulnerability assessment, as well as provide techniques for flood proofing their buildings. Our working group will also share the lessons they learned in selecting and using the type of flood proofing for their buildings. We are also offering optional site visits of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum as part of our vulnerability assessment discussion and the, and the National Archives for a demonstration of their self-rising floodgates. That concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions. And we also have our partner, Roger Gans, from DC Water to um, assist me in answering any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Tars. Comments on the study or questions for Ms. Tars? Mr. Hart? Uh, obviously, this is a, a pretty important study. Um, and. I am encouraged that you're looking at uh, flood events that are beyond the 100-year flood uh, hazard. It, it reminded me of my experience when I was doing uh, Hurricane Katrina work uh, after the entire Gulf Coast was inundated. And uh, there were visitors from Belgium and the Netherlands that came out to witness the the, the damage and in taking them around the Corps of Engineers was showing these folks the the levees and the, the visitor said well you know what what event were you trying to prevent here and when the Corps of Engineers said we're trying to prevent the hundred year event these guys were speechless and so the Corps said well what do you you know calculate and they said the 10,000 year stuff the 10,000 year flood event and that's not good enough uh, I think that the the core of our government uh, you know, agencies warrants a much higher standard than the corner store or somebody's house in trying to prevent uh, damage and to mitigate any of this, these kinds of events. So the higher the standard, the better. Uh, 
particularly given the fact that these are extremely important uh, agencies and artifacts that are in this area. Con comment about uh, Katrina lessons learned. One of the best presentations I've heard was sponsored by Federal Facilities Council and the National Research Council uh, was uh, General Russell Honore, who had a small role in that recovery effort. And there was multiple lessons learned, uh, such as uh, raising the standard to a 500-year events uh, at a minimum, taking uh, uh, critical infrastructure out of basements of federal facilities and moving them to upper floors, those types of things. So. Uh, I highly recommend uh, his uh, published report. Others? Mr. May? Yeah, uh, a couple of questions. Um, can you uh, explain to me uh, um, what the difference is between 200-year and 100-year and 15-year floods in terms of, I don't know, how many inches of rain that is or how many inches per hour or whatever? Because it's not, I mean, you know, the automatic reflex is to think it's a 200-year event is uh, is twice as bad as a 100-year event, which is not anywhere close to the truth. Um, I don't, Roger, would you like to answer that? Do we need the book? <laughs> we, we don't have our numbers right now next to us. Is on? Is on? Yeah. I think so. Well, I can't answer with numbers. Um, the, the events are determined by the uh, frequency and duration. The, I mean, the intensity and duration of the storm and the... And the um, NOAA publishes that kind of data. Uh, you'd have to know both the intensity and the duration, and then you could figure out what kind of event it is, 15 years, you know, on the average once every 15 years and so forth. Did that answer your? No. Um, <laughs> well, but relatively speaking, I mean, how much worse is it to have, I mean, we're ta just ta let's compare it to the 2006 event where we had five hours of rain. Right. I, I mean, the most intense rain. I would have to look at the table. So, how, the well, how many inches do we have on that in that event in five hours? Do we remember anybody know that number? Uh, I don't. Not without the report. Does it show on your graph? Show the graph. I don't have. Yeah, I don't have the that for for June 2006. We do have it in our report. Right. But for purposes of this presentation, we didn't want to get bogged down with all the numbers. Okay, well, I, I, did, I did alert people that I was going to want to get into the numbers a little bit at this presentation, so I'm a little surprised. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll just read the report when that comes out. Um, how much larger um, than this, what you're showing right there, how much larger is that than uh, what the Park Service is planning to build with the Mall Turf project? Yeah, so we, we, tried, to, we tried to compare. Ms. Torres, use the microphone. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's a little sliver of yellow here, right in the street. Yeah. That's the scale of what the Park Service is building. And so this is the scale for a 50-year storm. And add that, the, the purple for a 100-year, and then uh, the red for the 200-year. So okay. this whole, the combination of all three colors will be for a 200-year storm. And, and are those of the same depth of, of cistern? Um, ours is 15 feet deep. Okay, I don't remember what ours are. Okay. Or that's and, and this graphic will be in the report that you released yes. shortly. Okay. Um, and then um, last question I have is with the, the sewer option, adding a, a 14 to 20 foot sewer um, to the O Street pumping station, would that then mean that the O Street pumping station needs to be upgraded to handle the additional volume or is there's capacity there's capacity okay and the, and the sewer would actually have to be a tunnel because there's no way to get a, a regular sewer through that area <laughs> yeah i could imagine trying to drop a 14 foot sewer into all that whole route that would be a problem okay that's it thanks One, Gil. well i'd like to uh, congratulate amy for really doing an excellent job of overseeing this study GSA contributed $100,000 to it, and we were active participants in the process. And we were able to use the data that the study generated to prepare for Hurricane Irene. We listened to the weather forecast. They talked about how many inches were going to fall over a 6- or 12-hour period. We then looked at the table from the flood study. We computed the uh, estimated level of ponding that would occur in Constitution Avenue under a worst-case scenario in this situation. And we... 15,000 sandbags along Constitution Avenue. And so it was very useful. 
And I wanted to, um, actually, Peter, I wanted to follow up with if maybe that's really what you're trying to find out, like if you're doing some future planning, how are you going to prepare for a 200-year flood? Because uh, we, we did prov uh, provide the ponding level predictions for um, all along Constitution Avenue for all the intersecting streets. So you could use that for then planning for the future. I'm, I'm less concerned about sort of the, the, the planning aspects of it because when we when we venture down that road we do it in partnership with either DC water or or um, Corps of Engineers in the case of the levy things like that I was just mostly trying to get sort of an order of magnitude sense of these events and I, that's not apparent from what you have here so but uh, hopefully I can glean that from the report Technical question about uh, pipe sizing, 14 to 20 feet. Is that, uh, we had a, a very positive experience at a, a project at the Pentagon to take uh, clean water from the Columbia Island Lagoon, pump it through our uh, uh, heating and refrigeration plant and uh, uh, the outfall section of the line at the Roaches Run Lagoon north of uh, Reagan Airport. And we found that uh, because it was clean, we could use fiberglass reinforced pipe and we could downsize it because of the improved coefficient of friction. And we went from something like a 60 inch pipe to a 48 inch pipe. Uh, is, would that also work for sanitary sewer? You could downsize? Mm, Can you? With those magnitudes and sizes, um, not too much. I don't think it would ha probably have to be reinforced concrete. Uh -huh. And you could line it with something and get a little better friction factor and a little right. more capacity. The reason I'm asking is we were, a, and we had favorable soil conditions, we were able to use the piping as the tunneling mechanism. So you, let, you tunneled and you laid pipe at the same time so it was quicker, quicker, cheaper, faster, and more effective and smaller. Mm -hmm diameter just, just this, this size for project would be it's this is an awful lot longer run so you probably and, have very and probably that's uh, uh, the type of tunnel that we're going to be putting in for our clean water our river project which is a uh, almost a it's greater than a metro sized tunnel this one would be almost as big anything else other comments or questions hearing none thank you Ms. Taurus very much and thank you is there anything else to come before the commission uh, before we adjourn? Hearing nothing, thank you for attendance today. We've had a good, uh, a good long meeting, a lot of good information, a lot of important projects covered. We will see you next month. The meeting's adjourned.